Okay, member, okay, members, so we have a quorum and welcome to today's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. Members, mo mobile phones must be set to airplane mode or on silent or turned off. It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. The session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed via live online streaming on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. Agenda item one, our apologies. Have we any members uh, who can't be with us today who you wish to apologise for? No apologies. Full House, thank you. Uh, item two then is the minutes of the 8th of October 2020, pages 5 to 11 of your pack. Um, are members content with those minutes? Great. No queries or concerns? With your permission to sign them? Okay. Agenda item three then is a declaration of members' interests. Members, uh, each meeting members are required to register relevant financial or other interests in the register of members' interests. Does any member have any interest they wish to declare this afternoon? Mr. Boylan. Yes, Chair. Uh, Register interest. I'm a governor on the board of governors of Clay Primary School, and also okay. oh, a vice chair of the All Party Working Group on Autism as well. Okay, Mr. Peggs. Um, <coughs> I'm a member of Carrick Fergus Horizon Sure Start, dealing with some children with special education uh, needs. Needs. Um, Rodensville Primary School. Uh, Rodensville uh, Primary School. Uh, a former governor of. Um, Glen Primary School and my dad's the chairman of Glen Primary School. Okay, any others? Mr. McKean. Yeah. Mr. McKean. <coughs> chairman of uh, uh, Nice Conlingerica Preschool, uh, so made him of Irish, and a past member of the Western Education and Library Board. Mr. Muir. Yeah. Member of the Board of Governors of Priory Integrated College in Hollywood. Any others? Okay, I have to declare an interest. I am. Oh, sorry. Yeah, not in this jurisdiction, but I was. Uh, um, on the Board of Governors of a Special Needs School in South London uh, a number of years back. Okay. Um, I have to declare notice as a member of the Board of Governors of the Girls Model School in North Belfast and Edinburgh Primary School. Okay. Matters arising then uh, are at item four on the agenda. Uh, are you content to note? Are you content that we remain in public session? Great. Okay. Agenda item five then is correspondence. Uh, pages 12 to 19. Members will refer to correspondence received on the 8th of October from uh, Ms Marie McHugh at pages 15 to 16 of your pack regarding the Charity Commission for Northern Ireland and the ramifications of the High Court rulings of May 2019 and February 2020. Members, Ms McHugh has given her permission to share this correspondence with whomever we deem uh, appropriate. Are you content that we forward this letter to the Northern Ireland Audit Office for comment and then write back to Ms McHugh informing her of this? Members content? Agreed. Agreed? Agreed. Yep. Members, refer to correspondence from Mr T. I. McManus dated the 8th of October 2020. Mr McManus uh, corresponds to pages 17 to 21 of your pack, asking if his letter on the 19th of July 2020 was received by the committee. Members, you can cont content to acknowledge receipt of this letter and the letter of the 19th of July 2020, and that we also write to the Audit Office to comment on Mr McManus's uh, correspondence. Great. Great. Okay. Agenda item six, then, is the evidence on the Northern Ireland Audit Office report on special educational needs, and that's pages 23 to 183 of your packs. Uh, at this stage, we would invite Mr. Derek Baker, the Permanent Secretary and Accounting Officer of the Department of Education, and Mr. Ricky Irwin, uh, Deputy of Inclusion and Wellbeing in the Department of Education, to the table, Mr. Karen Donnelly, the Controller and Auditor General in attendance, and um, Mr. Stuart Stevenson, TOA, will be joining the meeting remotely. Mr. Stevenson, can you hear us? Can you hear us, Mr. Stevenson? Yes, Chair, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay, we can hear you. You're very welcome this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon to um, Mr. Baker, to Mr. Irwin, and to Mr. Donnelly. Um, Mr. Baker, um, you're very welcome this afternoon, and we appreciate the time that you and Mr. Irwin have taken because we appreciate the work that your department and your uh, colleagues have been involved in in terms of COVID 19 and the, the dreadful pandemic in which we're currently. Faced, and would thank you for all the work that 
Department of Education doing around this issue uh, in our in our schools uh, and and youth work uh, hugely important to uh, the nation in terms of making sure that uh, uh, normality, uh, this new norm as it's being called, is actually um, appearing to be to be <coughs> upheld in the classroom. And I know many many parents, if not all parents, greatly appreciate that. So thank you. Um, I would ask if you want to make an opening statement on the subject matter we're here to discuss today, and then, of course, as you know, uh, members will then ask questions. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I may, I would just like to provide two points of information for the benefit of committee members. The first is a significant event which has occurred since publication of the Audit Office report, and that is almost by coincidence it was previously planned, the Minister for Education published at the end of September for extended consultation the full set of draft special education needs regulations, which will give effect to the Special Education Needs and Disability Act 2016. And alongside that, the Minister published for consultation the draft statutory code of practice, which will accompany the regulations. The latter document is arguably more important. Um, I wouldn't have expected committee members to have read all of that. It's very voluminous material running to many hundreds of pages. But the code of practice sets out in considerable detail all of the new arrangements uh, which are part of the SEN framework. It sets out the roles and responsibilities of all the players, the education authority, schools, boards of governors, principals, the arrangements for liaison between health and education, um, the arrangements and the timescales for developing personal learning plans for annual reviews, the arrangements for how the dispute avoidance resolution and the mediation arrangements will work. Um, it sets out uh, draft templates for all of those documents. So it is a very important piece of work and it picks up many of the issues and indeed many of the acknowledged deficiencies and difficulties in SEN provision which have been identified in the Audit Office report. So the likelihood is that I will refer to those issues during the session as appropriate. The second point, Chair, is just a more personal point and I don't want to lead committee members. As, as you know, um, I'm sure the committee will want to look backwards and forwards, but I have about two weeks left before I retire, so in terms of looking forwards, I don't want to mislead committee members about things that I will or will not be doing in the future. After about two weeks, I won't be around anymore in the Department of Education. That's all I'll say at this stage, Chair. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, Mr Hillage? Uh, thanks, Chair. Just a couple to yourselves before most of mine will probably be the, ed the Education Authority, but you're very welcome. Uh, this afternoon. <clears throat> has, has it been a case in the past, particularly where, uh, where there was a changeover from the board to the uh, authority as such? Uh, placing a, a, a quality leadership team in there, has, we're obviously sitting in a temporary leadership situation. Has that in any way reflected on the difficulties that we face in the report? I think it is. I think it's a fair comment. Um, in fairness to the Education Authority, I believe it had a very difficult and overly long gestation, and in large measure that was a, a direct consequence of the time it actually took for the legislation to find its way through the Assembly. Um, the birth of the Education Authority took a very long time, and I think the previous Legacy 5 Education and Library Boards effectively had a sort of Damocles hanging over them for a long time. <coughs> They lost a lot of staff, they lost a lot of corporate expertise, corporate memory, and so when the Education Authority eventually came into being in 2015, after many years of uncertainty, it probably was firing on two cylinders and not on four cylinders. And it took a while for it to recover from that and establish a fully functioning senior management team. So I think it's fair comment that you make. So you, you would say that all that situation, does that talk currently exist? Uh, because obviously there's been like, the voluntary redundancy packages and various things over a period of time. That experience has been lost, obviously, to the department? It, it has, but um, in fairness to the Education Authority, it has gone through a change of senior leadership, both at board level 
and the chief executive level and at director level in recent years. And I think the education authority is getting back up to the place that it needs to be in having um, a permanent senior team in place to take things forward. And I think we are seeing that in some of the improvements that have been brought through in the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, just on the financial side of things, and of course throwing money at something will not fix the problems. Of course, if the issues themselves remain un unresolved, but uh, a couple of years back, the audit office carried out a report on the financial health of schools, uh, which showed there had been a 10% reduction in real terms of uh, mainstream budgets over the previous 10 years. Uh, do you think that the reduction in real terms in mainstream budgets over that past 10 years has resulted in greater pressure on SEM services and the provisions delivered by the authority? Without a shadow of doubt, um, I'm afraid I could bore the committee to death going on about budgetary problems in education because we have been grappling with them, but I think you have summarised the salient points. Since the start of the decade, the education budget generally has reduced in real terms by 10-12%. We've lost about £200 million of spending power, and that inevitably has increased pressures on schools. And that's manifested in increasing school deficits. And the audit office itself, as you say in its own report, um, cited uh, school finances as being, I regard this as a euphemism, at a tipping point. In my view, it was going over a cliff. Now, that will place pressure on the ability of schools to deal with special education needs from within their own budgets. And that's currently at stages one, two, and three of the current arrangements, and that has played out. Um, so there is no doubt in my mind that that is part of the difficulty. Whilst we have tried to protect the overall school's budget over that period, it has reduced in real terms by about 8% since the start of the decade. In England, by contrast, the government has managed to increase the school's budget by 7% in real terms. Those are stark figures, and it's a very difficult problem for schools to grapple with. Okay. And that, that, that being the case, then, is, is the radical review of the Common Funding Formula for the mainstream school connected to the systemic review of education? Should it be connected directly? It should. Uh, now, we stood, that is, officials stood up the review of the Common Funding Formula in the absence of ministers. We initiated, and we perhaps we're taking a step into the unknown, but in the absence of ministers, we stood up a small-scale transformation program to look at a number of areas that hopefully we would have some recommendations for ministers in when ministers returned. <coughs> and one of those was looking at the common funding formula and how we fund schools. Um, it is quite a complicated formula. There are 19 different factors which come into play in the way we allocate money to schools. But remarkably, none of those factors relates to special education needs. So we wanted to see whether there was a different way of doing it. Now, one warning in respect of that, um, if we're just changing the factors around but not increasing the overall size of the budget, you're moving the deck chairs around on the deck of, course, of the yeah. Titanic. And we do have to recognise that. But I think there is a big question mark over the fact that schools have to fund special education needs at stages one to three from their own delegated resources, and we take no account of that mm. in the factors which are deployed in allocating money to schools the way we do, for example, for newcomer children or targeting social need or Irish medium or other things like that. Um, but that uh, review was stalled when COVID came along in March, and it's something that we would intend to resurrect in due course. Okay, thank you. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I appreciate your time, especially in, as the Chair has outlined in the current circumstances, which are unprecedented, so, so much has been put in relation um, to that. Um, just a couple of um, sort of questions. And as Mr. Heldich has outlined, most of my questions are really for the Education Authority, rather than yourself, and you understand the distinction between the two bodies. But um, it, it is made, out, uh, made, made clear that there is a review. The review started um, many years ago, and £3.6 million has been spent on that review. Why is that review going on for so long, and whether that money spent so far is, in your mind, value for money? Yeah. I have to say it's a question I asked myself when I first saw that this review had been going on for so long, and I think I would have been alarmed 
if I had thought that there was a group of officials working in the bowels of Rathgale House for 13 years and suddenly they popped out. When I investigated that further and dig into it, and you go back over, the, over history, you will find that there probably were a number of reviews in there, and it gets bound up with changes. I mean, we're going back over four ministerial mandates. You, have, you get um, bound up in individual ministerial preferences, policies, different consultations. I mean, the original review resulted in consultation by a minister. There was a series of proposals presented, and some of those were very radical, and they did not find favour. For example, the notion of providing some kind of redress to parents, the notion of broadening much more widely the definition of special education, they bring other groups in. That ran into the buffers. Uh, when it came back, it was no longer a ministerial priority at the time, so it rested. A new minister came along and decided that special education needs would be a priority. And that eventually had to be consulted on again and resulted in proposals to the executive in 2012. And thereafter, you get into the legislative process, which resulted in the act. So I take your point entirely. Prima facie, it looks as if a single review has been going on forever and ever and ever. But there were different facets to that. I, I would make, I mean, I have thought about this point. The 3.6 million you refer to are the salaries of staff who work in a policy area in the Department of Education. Now, even after these regulations, if they are adopted by the Assembly in due course, staff will continue to be employed in the Department of Education working in the policy area of SEN. And even if these regulations are adopted, that's not the end of it. We will not take a box and we will not say, that's SEN, done and dusted, we move on. For example, I don't want to preempt the work of this committee, but no doubt it will produce a report with recommendations. The Children's Commissioner produced a report with 40 recommendations on SEN in March of this year. There is the Audit Office report with recommendations. There is the whole set of regulations that need to be implemented. This is a process of continuous improvement and review and refinement as things move along. So that's a long-winded way of saying I don't think we will get to the point where we'll say that's it, Dan's finished, tick the box and move. <coughs> it will continue as a process of improvement. Now, thank you for your response. I understand that. Um, the issue for me is whether £3.6 million pounds spent and all the different reviews, and many of them not actioned upon, is good value for money in terms of the use of public resources and what could have been used to yeah. assist in the whole, essentially, children and young people who are in need of assistance. Yeah, as I said, the 3.6 million relates to staff who work in the department, and they would have been there anyway, probably, in the department. But you're right, if we didn't have a review of special education needs and we hadn't developed the legislation in the Code of Practice, those staff would have been working on something else. And uh, whether you believe it's good value for money, it, you know, when you reach the end of a process, to have a set of regulations and a totally new paradigm to deliver SEN is a very difficult question to answer. Mm -hmm. There is always an opportunity cost. If you spend 3.6 million over a period of 13 years in staff, you could have spent that on staff looking at educational underachievement or uh, shared education or something completely different. But it's a really difficult one to say whether spending money on a review of special education needs is better than spending it on some other kind of policy area. But I mean, I, I fully accept the point that Prima Facie is saying, you know, a review has gone on for 13 years just looks bad. It looks wrong. But I would make the point that this has gone in many different directions since, and it will continue. We will continue to need staff to review policy and practice and processes even after the implementation of these regulations. Just one more question, Chair, if that's possible. Um, from reading the latest audit office report and then the previous one, and also in terms of so many constituents contact me in relation to real concerns around special education needs, it's probably one of the biggest issues that people <coughs> contact me about, and it's an issue that affects people personally. I find the latest report is a damning indictment of the governance arrangements in place within the Department of Education and also within the Education Authority and how we managed to come to this. And you know, how, how, how do you think those governance arrangements are, do you think are fit for purpose? 
do you think that the, how do we actually get to the situation? Because both the Department of Education and the Education Authority need to be held to account for what's happened here, and we need to ensure that this does not have another audit office report saying that we're still in the same situation. Yeah, I, I think you make a very good point. And needless to say, you know, as an accounting officer, when I receive an audit office report and when you're preparing for a public accounts committee, you reflect on such matters. Um, and I'm in the same position as you. Of the five things that keep me awake at night and fill my in-tray and my inbox, special education needs is up there along with budget, budget, budget. It is the one where I get the most complaints from elected representatives like yourselves, from the public, from parents. I have met with parents and advocacy groups and the Children's Commissioner, and some of the stories I get are quite anguished, so I agree with that entirely. In terms of governance arrangements in the department, and I've reflected on this too, under my tenure, the thing that I should have done, and it's I personally should have done, I hold on a regular basis, three times a year, a formal set-piece governance meeting with all of the arm's length bodies. Um, and we deal with things like budgets and governance and pr propriety and probity and accountability. The thing that I should have um, delved much more into much more robustly and asked much more pointed questions about <coughs> was the time taken for statutory assessments. I accepted too readily the point about valid exceptions. If we weren't meeting the 26 weeks, why not? Well, those are because of valid exceptions. I should have been saying, tell me more about those valid exceptions. Explain that to me. Why do they exist? Why are we not clearing those out? So I readily accept that that was my responsibility because I chair that meeting. It's nobody else's. In terms of the governance arrangements in the Education Authority itself, the Chief Executive can answer for that, but I think it's fair to say that the Education Authority has recognised its own deficiencies in that. It, it uh, commissioned and undertook a very detailed report into its own management practices and special education needs. It was anything but a whitewash. It shone a very harsh light into it, and I think the Chief Executive publicly has acknowledged that, and they have taken robust action, both in management terms, HR terms, and service delivery terms to address those issues. So I think you make a valid point, and there is real substance to it, both for me in the Department and for the Education Authority. Thank you. And I'd like to say thanks for the candour. It's appreciated. Thank you, Mr. McHugh. Yes, uh, thank you, Roland. <coughs> so, very welcome this evening. Here. Um, you referred to the gestation period, uh, and that's in relation to the setting up of the Education Authority in itself. Yeah. Yeah. Was that not the unique opportunity um, uh, to ensure that people had fine tuned uh, uh, systems? Uh, in fact, that uh, it wasn't enough to say that we didn't know that it was coming. Because as a member of the Western Education Library Board, we thought that it was coming every year, I know. in a sense, and that, uh, uh, and at the same time, you know, uh, you thought that over that period of time they should have had the house in order. I, I mean, in theory, you are absolutely right, and in practice, as a member of the Western Education and Library Board, you will have experienced directly what happened. People left because they were under threat of redundancy or losing their jobs, and they disappeared very quickly. And the organizations, both organizations, were degraded, and it was a massive risk to the delivery of education over that period. What went into the now I'm speaking from recollection here. What went into the assembly at the start by way of a legislative proposal for the creation of a new body was actually very different from what came out the other end, and things chopped and changed. And it was very difficult to plan in detail for the establishment of the new body, because it was subject to very, very difficult, and I understand this, very difficult political considerations. But many staff just left, and it was really difficult to recruit to an organization which had massive question marks over it for a very long time. So there probably was an inevitability to the organization losing a lot of corporate capacity. But I think we've got through that period. Happily, it has taken a while to get through it. And I personally, from the perspective of the department, see a much stronger managerial focus in the Education Authority, a much greater focus on performance, 
and on developing quality performance indicators by which we can measure the delivery of special education needs services and indeed the whole range of pupil support services. Uh, and in addition to the Chair, uh, to clarify for myself, because I'm not sure just where all of this sits, uh, in relation to the uh, inspectorate, yeah. and uh, I would think that the inspectorate have a very, very significant role to play at the present time in particular in terms of uh, SEN in the schools themselves uh, and, and the way the schools deliver. Uh, uh, what, in fact, is your role there? Yeah, the Education and Training Inspectorate is an integral part of the Department of Education and they are a really important resource because it is through school inspection that elected representatives, ministers, accounting officers, everybody, the public, receive assurance about the quality of teaching and learning in schools. Now, you're probably aware that since 2017, four of our teaching unions have been on industrial action, action short of strike. And one of the manifestations of that has been a refusal to cooperate with inspection. So that effectively meant that we could not properly, or the inspectorate could not properly carry out school inspections for a number of years. Happily, when the assembly returned and the education minister came in earlier this year, um, he managed to negotiate with the finance minister a package to end that. So we can start inspections, but of course schools closed with COVID and inspection isn't happening. But to get to an important point, you are right. When an individual inspection of a school takes place, it is part and parcel of the core inspection that they will inspect um, special education needs provision in the school. But secondly, and we have been stymied by three years of industrial action, task number one for when we restart school inspections, um, and we've, we've paused inspections now because of COVID, because we really can't send inspectors into schools given what we're dealing with, is to carry out a thorough evaluation of special education needs at a strategic level in terms of the progress that pupils make so that we can play that into policy, to strategy, to training, to information gathering. We managed to do a limited inspection on foot of the 2017 Audit Office report, but it really was focusing on good practice and we've disseminated that. But we need the more detailed inspection to respond to the recommendation which the CNAG made in the 2017 report. So you're right, inspection is right at the core of establishing and maintaining good practice. Um, Ricky? If, if I may add to that, um, through the Chair, the ETA has been strengthening its capacity in terms of its level of CN expertise within the current um, inspectorate team. Uh, and we've been working with them on the terms of reference for the next phase of the evaluation that they'll um, carry out in relation to the same. So as Derek had said, the focus will be very much on um, those interventions which are working well for children with SEN, what's not working well, and the effectiveness of the early intervention preventions, which I think is critical in this piece uh, in terms of notifying the EA uh, of their services and what's, what's happening and what's not happening. So there's been quite considerable preparation work done uh, for when the inspection services can resume. Thank you, Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Beggs. <coughs> Again, thanks for coming along and helping to shine some light into what has been happening here. Um, I refer to paragraph 10 in, in the report, and in it it says that in the opinion of the audit office, the funding for uh, special educational needs service is not financially sustainable, this model. What's your view of that? It depends what you mean by not sustainable. Um, I believe we probably need more funding in special education needs from what we currently have. Why do I say that? It's on the basis of the demand which keeps coming at us. And bear in mind, this is a demand-led service in many respects. If the legislation so dictates that a statement of need is required for a pupil or a group of pupils, there is no choice but to make that provision. When we look ahead to the new arrangements that we want to put in place on foot of the uh, regulations, the draft regulations, I should say, and the draft code of practice, one of the core things that we want to do to improve um, the provision of support at school level is to free up the time of what are currently called 
um, special education age coordinators, SENCOs, what will be called learning support coordinators, so that they have the facility to provide better level of support at individual school level. And we estimate that the full year cost of that will be £33 million, pounds because we will have to provide substitute teachers or backfill for those people. On foot of the original Audit Office report, um, when comments were made about the cost, we did try to benchmark what we spend in Northern Ireland on special education needs against other jurisdictions. It is very difficult to do a like-for-like -like comparison because the arrangements are very different across the United Kingdom. But in England, to our um, surprise, on the best like-for-like -like comparison, we actually spend far less per pupil than they spend in England on special education needs. We're spending just over £6,000 a year. In England, they're spending up to £10,000 a year. And that goes back to the first point I made on budgets. For a child with statement, we're spending about £4,500 in England. It's £29,000. So in England, they are managing to spend far more than we are. Now, that is not a measure of efficiency. I know that. But it might be a measure of economy. And I think that for as long as the needs out there continue to rise, and I talk to principals, I talk to principals all the time, and they tell me that what is presenting at the school gate is getting increasingly complex. We have a problem. But, you know, the report is absolutely right. What is the response to this? Well, we can go and look for more money, and that might be a forlorn hope, because we know the budgetary situation. But we need to make sure that every penny we spend is well spent. I accept that. And that goes back to the point I was making about the need for a thorough um, evaluation by the Education and Training Inspectorate into practice in schools so that we can identify the best practice and focus on that. Uh, that is really important. We haven't managed to do it because of the action short of strike, but we will when we get out the other end of COVID. I once spoke to a classroom uh, assistant experienced at primary school level. Yeah. They'd taken a post at secondary school and express, she expressed her frustration at standing at the back of the classroom, sometimes with multiple classroom assistants doing nothing, waiting for something to happen. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, she, she couldn't hack it. She gave the job up and went back to primary school where she was intervening and felt she was contributing. So do you think the current model, if that's, is that still happening? And, and does it show value for money and what, what is happening? No, that doesn't show value for money. That's indefensible. So can that still happen? No. Well, it, it could. It, I mean, I cannot be in an individual school and know what is happening in an individual school because obviously we delegate budgets to school leaders and it's for school leaders to decide what happens in their schools in terms of the deployment of staff. But that is why it is really important that we get inspection back up and running again so that we can do a strategic evaluation of what the practice is in individual schools and focus on best practice. Of course, that is not value for money if a classroom assistant is standing at the back of the class not being gainfully employed and can't hack it to the extent that they leave. I agree with you entirely, but that is down to the local management of those staff in the school by the school leadership team. But we need to evaluate that and we need to assess that. And the mechanism for doing it is through inspection. We Derek, need to get in there and do it. If, if I may add to that, Derek, through the Chair, um, the level of classroom assistance and adult assistance in general has increased quite considerably over recent years in terms of the numbers and the expenditure. And that's linked to the point that Derek made about the complexity of the needs of children, children who are presenting at this time. It requires more one-to-one -one support. But the EA has acknowledged that it needs to look in more detail, and uh, they will tell you this themselves at the model that they uh, use in relation to classroom assistance, and it has undertaken <coughs> to do that as part of a wider programme of improvement which is currently underway. So you have now decided to look at the model of how you use classroom assistance. Are you only deciding that now? Hundreds of millions of pounds have been spent on this. So um, the classroom assistance model has clearly been one of the issues that uh, needs further investigation. But what are your concerns? <coughs> is there that, that you've decided to investigate this? What, what, what are the issues that you've taken this issue forward? Um, it's, the, it's part of the EA's wider programme of improvement around the individual operational processes which it employs for supporting children with SEN. Um, we will be supporting them in the delivery of that programme, and I have no doubt that um, Sarah and Una will cover more detail around that when they come in to speak to you shortly. C can, you I, sorry. can you just clarify? Sorry. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not fully knowledgeable of, of how the process works, but 
so many hours are allocated to, to a child. So does the classroom assistant follow that child for a set hours, even though there's one or two others yeah. in, in the classroom? So you can easily have multiple adults standing at the back of the classroom, not actually doing one-to-one -one engagement, but waiting in case uh, they may be needed. Is that, is that the model that's happening at the present? Where a classroom assistant is deemed necessary to support a child in a school through a statementing process, that will have been as a result of a input from a series of qualified professionals. It could be a community paediatrician, it could be a social worker, it could be speech and language therapist, it will have been an educational psychologist, an educationalist, collect and, and the school leaders, and they together will decide what the statement of needs um, are for each and every individual child. And if it is decided that a classroom assistant is the most appropriate, that's why a classroom assistant will be there. Now, I can't comment on what is happening in each and every individual school, but I take your point entirely. If classroom assistants are not being properly employed in individual schools, that needs to be addressed. But classroom assistants are not thrown willy-nilly at individual children. It is as a consequence of an assessment by a range of professionals. But the assessment doesn't take any... Any, any, any awareness of whether there are two or three other classroom assistants well, in that Well, it would. At a room? local level, it would. And not all classroom assistants are employed for, at, uh, you know, for the same yeah. number of hours. Some of them might be spread around a number of children. Some might be full-time, some might be part-time, some might deal with the whole class. So they're employed in lots of different ways, and there are lots of different employment models for classroom assistants. Okay, I, I want to turn now to paragraph 2.8 about um, where it says there, there wasn't enough focus on special education needs as part of initial teacher education. This has been known for, for decades that this is, uh, has been a, a growing area of concern where additional support and expertise is, is needed. Uh, so why is it that uh, in our teacher training colleges there has been uh, a variety of levels of training in this area given to our new teachers. That's the best time to ensure that future teachers are well informed about special educational needs. Why is it, why is it still an issue that there is inconsistent levels of training and the degree of training in our higher uh, 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 institution levels? And work has been done to make sure that built in to initial teacher education for all our newly qualified teachers are modules of special education needs. Now, what we don't do at the initial teacher education stage is provide in-depth training for each and every facet of special education needs. It is more a genu general uh, module on SEN, um, which is mandatory for all newly qualified teachers now. The report says that the, the, uh, there has been a range of differences and disparities in the approaches adopted by individual higher education institutions. Does the department not have some sort of say of what is would be a, a sensible level of training and expertise in this area? Training and expert, yeah, well, it does. But in terms of accreditation of initial teacher education, we have a body called the General Teaching Council in Northern Ireland, which provides accreditation for all the teaching that, sorry, for all the initial training that is provided to all our teachers, and that's how we get consistency across that. In addition to initial teacher education. Of course, we provide or ensure that there is provision of a suite of continuing professional development for teachers. Um, that is updated regularly by the Education Authority. There is a compendium of training available for our teachers. We also ensure that support is provided for our teachers in specific areas like autism through the Middletown Centre for Autism, so that support can be provided at the initial stage but right throughout their careers, as needs change. Uh, and then finally, if I may, Mr Chairman, uh, 2017 report in the special education need uh, indicated that there was an absence of meaningful assessment or inspection and no evidence that school are identifying children with SEN in a consistent and timely way. Now, that's three years ago. And this report says we remain of the view that the Department and EA cannot demonstrate value for money in the provision of support for children with education, special educational needs. Uh, are you satisfied that, that there has been sufficient improvement uh, since this last report has been uh, completed, highlighting this issue to you, uh, and you are the Permanent Secretary with the responsibility to take uh, cognizance of 
our office report. So what have you done to ensure that there's been significant improvement in this area? Yeah. In response to your question, am I satisfied? No, I'm not. I accept that. Um, the um, original audit office report highlighted the fact that value for money could be established through uh, an evaluation of SEND practice in schools. Now, I've already explained that immediately after the 2017 report, we commissioned the Education and Training Inspector to carry that out. But unfortunately, the action short of strike stymied that and prevented it from being carried out. We just couldn't do it. Teachers were not cooperating with inspection. You can't force an inspector to go into a classroom, teacher with down tools, and not teach and not engage at all. So that is why it's the number one priority Having resolved the action short of strike in April of this year, and when we get out the other side of COVID, we've paused inspection in the context of COVID, so that this is the number one priority for inspection. Could I, if I could just add to that, in terms of the inconsistent approach um, oh, yeah. mentioned, the code of practice is the statutory guidance that all schools should have regard to, and following the two, 2017 report. Um, schools and, and, and um, all education settings were reminded of the need to have regard to that um, code of practice. We also work with the EA to put a programme of training in, in anticipation of the new code of practice, which would again remind um, principals, teachers and centres of the need to follow the code of practice. It sets out clearly in terms of identification, assessment and provision for children and SEND to avoid those, in, those inconsistencies. One of the issues of the code of practice is that um, um, the, the assessment should be completed on a timely basis. But, but there's a Department of Edu or sorry, Education Authority um, limits the numbers of children who can be put forward for edu education psychology assessment, and that manages the system and creates a bottleneck. So you don't know the scale of the problem that's there. Is that not true? The code of practice and how it's working out is not working. The Code of Practice is currently out for consultation and has been strengthened since the 1998 version. That is one of the major criticisms that has come forward. Um, the EA has acknowledged that it needs to look at its model of educational psychologist provision. There are two aspects to that provision. One is in relation to access to the Stage 3 Code of Practice services, um, and they have a model for that, which, in my opinion, uh, is not working correctly and needs to change. The second aspect is in relation to the statutory assessment process, um, and uh, they do not um, hold back in terms of the allocation of educational psychologists' time for statutory assessment. The model where the difficulties lies in relation to stage three. So again, the EA uh, are, are, have a program to look and improve those processes, and could probably talk in more detail about that when they come in. But can, can I just add? I mean, I agree with you entirely. In terms of the statutory assessment, the statement of needs, the timescales being exceeded, that is the area that I accepted, you know, the point made by Mr. Muir, that I and we in the department should have investigated that much more robustly and challenged the Education Authority much more robustly in the valid exceptions. Why are there so many valid exceptions? Why are they drifting? So I accept your point on that. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and you are very welcome. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, Chair, most of the questions in, in relation to the report has been aired already, but just want to pick up on some points. Um, Derek, it's fair to say we have failed children. Do you agree with that? We have failed some children and I have met parents of some children and it was a sobering experience for me. So I accept that because we're dealing with vulnerable children here and we're dealing with parents who want the mm -hmm. best for those children and they haven't always got the best. Absolutely. I, and I mentioned the context of we're all adults, there's a lot of professions out there and parents have put their trust in all of us collectively, no matter what has happened over a period of time. But it seems over a 13-year period, we definitely have failed some of the children. And that's wrong, and even even their contribution to society as well. We've, mm -hmm. we've failed that, and, and we have to accept that because um, we're looking at a report and we're looking back to the past. And I appreciate you started by saying some of you know the, the ministers alluded to some of the recommendations or whatever. But see, in terms of of the recommendations, there's 10 recommendations. Where are we in terms of those? What have we learned from them? What do we intend implementing? 
Can you just expand a wee bit okay. on, on some of the recommendations? Can I just go back to the general point of having failed children? Okay. We haven't failed all children. I mean, as the Audit Office report acknowledges, one of the measures that we have at an overall system level for education is educational attainment. No, it's not a perfect measure. I'm talking about attainment in examinations. It is a narrow measure. I accept that. And it isn't as holistic as we'd want it to be. Nonetheless, it is a measure that is used, is a measure that is used in the draft programme for government. And that's attainment at GCSE level, A star to C, five GCSEs, including English and maths. Now, over a period of less than a decade, the attainment levels for children with special education needs at that level have improved dramatically. Those are outcomes. Those are educational outcomes. That's actually a success story. They've improved from about 24% attaining that level to 41% now. Um, by contrast, children without SEN have improved at a lesser level. So the gap is closing, and that is a real success story. So I would qualify my point about failing children. Some children have been failed, but in overall system terms, there has been an improvement. But I do take your point. I get stories all the time of individual children. Well, I, I maybe, and I'll clarify the point I was trying to make, really, because uh, I want to know how we quantify the number or qualify yeah. the number of people that we have failed. That's, well, because that, that's a key, and yeah. it's something we should be thinking about as, as we've learned from, yeah. from this report and as we move on. That's one of the key elements I want to make, and you'd have to agree with that. To, to yeah, no, they're in, and I think part of that. Is, and I'll go, back to your, I'll go back to your very first question about the 10 recommendations in a moment, because I don't yeah, want to lose okay. sight of that. Um, I mentioned at the start about a new statutory code of practice and all the arrangements that go with it that are out there for consultation. Now, a key component of the new arrangements that the Minister has put out there is the concept of a personal learning plan for each and every pupil with special education needs. And that is different from the current arrangements. It will be recorded. It will be recorded on the school's information management system. There is a prescribed format for that, and it will record outcomes and progress. And because it is online, we will be able to use that information at an individual level, a school level, and an overall system level to cut and dice the information to get a much better handle on the progress overall of children in the system. So we will see, hopefully, who we are failing and who we are not failing. But that's one for the future. In terms of the suite of recommendations in the original 2017 report, many of those have been advanced, and the 2020 report provides details on that. We have, for example, invested significantly in training of people who work in the area of special education needs. We've spent over four million training school leaders, principals, SENCOs, building capacity in the system. And we were taking a bit of a flyer because we are anticipating the Assembly passing the new regulations. They might not, but building capacity for that. We have got much better information about what we are spending on each and every element of SEN services, whereas back in 2016, after the five education library boards came together, we didn't have that information. We do now. We have it in great detail, and that will facilitate the valuation of that. The 2017 report recommended that we needed a strategic evaluation of SEN services. Now, I've explained we tried to do that with inspection. We did a best practice report, but it wasn't enough. So that's on our radar screen to do immediately. We have invested a lot of time and effort getting better liaison and cooperation arrangements with health and social care. And they have responded really, really well. And they are up and running, and they are working better. Every health and social care trust has a special education needs coordinator. We have streamlined the way we exchange information between ourselves. We have provided a template so that all of those health and social care professionals providing information back provide it in a way that helps the educational psychologists and the staff in the EA to produce a statement more quickly and in a more streamlined manner. So we have dealt with a lot of issues, and obviously we have focused on the time scales issues in the draft regulations and the draft code of practice, which prescribe in great detail how the whole process should operate. 
That's not just the statementing, that's the exchange of information, that's the dispute avoidance resolution service, that's the uh, independent statutory mediation service. It's all set out in great detail in the Code of Practice. So I think we have addressed as so far as we can in the context of the absence of ministers, the action short of strike and then COVID, all of the recommendations that we could to varying degrees. No, I, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the strike and the lack of, but I'll go back to this. There's a number of professionals and a number of adults there who could have carried on some of those actions. So over a long period of time, there was people in responsibility. Because I mean, you know, if we look at, er, we, all, we all talk about early intervention. Mm. If I asked you a question about preschool and primary school, yeah. and I understand the processes, yeah. but certainly if you ask within those streams and people who work in those streams, they can clearly identify them. So we should have been all working in partnership. You yeah. mentioned health and other partners, different departments. We, we should have been able to you know, work together. That's the point, and that's, that's what's clearly coming out of the report, yeah. and I, I appreciate your answer in, in relation. But there's a number of years there we could have done a lot better in terms of working with our partners. No, I, I, I accept we could have done better, but there have been investments made. You know, for example, we have stood up, and the minister recently has developed, and it's not specifically SEN, but it plays into SEN, and it's about early intervention, a new suite of nurture units, which hopefully is part of that early intervention, which may further um, downstream avoid the need for special education needs intervention. Um, in terms of what are the improvements, what have the improvements been over that period? Um, I mentioned earlier that I think there is a much, a much greater focus in the education authority on addressing the problems. A year ago, there were over 100 cases of um, statements uh, which hadn't been completed within 80 weeks. Now, that's outrageous, 80 weeks. Today, or at the end of September, that number is zero. A year ago, there were um, nearly 160 <coughs> cases outstanding for 60 weeks. That number is 10 at the end of September. And a year ago, there were over 260 cases outstanding, 40 weeks. That is now 44. They are trying to improve on all fronts they have, and they are particularly targeting the longer cases where children are waiting and families are waiting, and it's right and proper that they do it. So improvements are being made across the board. Maybe not quickly enough. I take your point, and I, I, I accept fully that families and individuals have suffered and it is really important that we make improvements. I do believe that the um, regulations in the Code of Practice that the Minister has published provides a real opportunity for a reset on SEN, combined with all of, the, all of the reports from various quarters. The Children Commissioner produced a really important report in March of this year, 40 recommendations. There's the Audit Office report. Um, there is the, I mean, the work on the SEN regulations and the code of practice. There's the work we've done ourselves on the SEN learner journey, looking at what's the experience for a child and a family, not through the eyes of a bureaucrat like me, someone writing regulations which are turgid and dry, but what is their actual experience and how can we make it better? Those things have all come together now, and we're in a position, I believe, to make a genuine reset of special education needs provision. Now, I won't be around, as I said at the start, deliver that, but we have set up a process whereby the Minister has asked me as the Permanent Secretary and I assume my successor to make sure that I oversee personally with the Chair and the Chief of the Executive of the Education Authority the comprehensive plan to deliver all of those things and all of those recommendations. And that plan will be developed in a co-design process not just with bureaucrats and officials and civil servants, but with parents, with teachers, with the Children's Commissioner, and that is really, really important. And that's the commitment that is being made right now on those issues. And, and in terms of just to try and qualify some of the, say, the failures of the past and, and identified in the report, can you quantify uh, in terms of the funding that played a part in, in those failures? I, I can't quantify the funding. I, mean, I think you made a general point that you know, clearly the education system is under funding pressure. That's well documented. Nobody disputes that. The education authority services are under massive pressure, and they have to deal with that, and they have been improving it. 
individual schools are under massive pressure. But, but I can't you know, put a figure and say if we had X hundred million more, that would all have been solved. Or um, you know, these feelings are attributable to you know, X percent or Y percent. It just is the general pressure on the whole system, the education system, is bearing down on the ability to deliver a quality service, but we do need to address that in the going forward. And, and these children are they are the vulnerable side of the education system. Some of them. And, and would they you, are, of course. Would you agree that would, would you recommend ring fencing for that side? Well, you will see, and the, the run of figures is included in the audit office reports, the proportion of the education budget that is spent on special education needs has been rising year on year on year and is consuming an ever greater proportion of the total education budget. Now, I think looking at that, the controller and auditor general quite rightly says that's unsustainable because eventually it will consume the whole budget if you keep on that trajectory and that is not realistic so we need to make sure we're getting the best bang for our buck in our spending but I think it's fair to say that we have allocated a much greater proportion of the budget each and every year over the period of about five or six years to special education needs children and that is a reflection of the Okay, thank you. Mr. Baker, um, you make mention of the, f the fact when the answer to questions earlier around the, the review is 13 years old and £3.6 million pounds has been expended on it. Um, I think, from, from my perspective, um, having met with the special education needs uh, teachers, both informally and formally when they came in front of the Education Committee, and the challenges that they face each day, mm. and we will all have issues of people coming in to our constituency offices and dealing with parents who are distraught because their child can't get statemented, because they can't get places in, in special schools. Um, that has a ripple out an effect on the classroom and other children in the classroom and the teachers and the classroom assistants on the entire uh, life that that child has, both then at school and then at home, because it's not a happy child. Um, that review having taken 13 years, I mean, it's, it's clear to me that a review is fundamental uh, and, and the outcomes of a review to considering the effectiveness of funding and allocation of funding for uh, SEN as we go forward, uh, whether a child is statemented or not, because yeah. not all children yeah. will be statemented, yeah. uh, but there still are children, many of them, as you will know, uh, who still require extra help and, and support. So this requires an evidence-based um, basis to go forward, and I think evidence is crucial. You mentioned about the inspection and the fact that this hasn't been able to go forward because of the inspection. Um, can I ask, when will you have the and your department have the robust evaluation associated with outcomes to actually be able to take this forward in terms of future planning? I would like to think that, that, will, that we will be able to ensure that the Education and Training Inspectorate evaluation is completed within the next six to nine months. It depends when we can send inspector, inspectors back into schools in the light of COVID. As you know, the Minister has taken a policy decision not to have inspection this term because of the struggles <laughs> that all schools have, but we need to do this as quickly as possible. No, I don't think we're starting from a zero evidence base here at all. A huge amount of work has been done, particularly over the course of the last three years, in preparing for the code of practice. And obviously, many people had input to the new draft code of practice, which has just been published for consultation. Um, we have been preparing the ground. We have been working with school principals. We have been working with uh, lots of interest groups to make sure that the new arrangements will be as effective as possible. And I think we can go ahead with that. And obviously, in your other role on the Education Committee, you will be considering that draft code of practice and the draft regulations. So I do not think we need wait until the Education and Training Inspectorate has completed an evaluation before we move forward with the improvements that are happening already. And I just mentioned earlier you know, how the timescales for waiting for a statement, and I, I share with you 
um, stories of the anguish of individual parents and individual children. You're absolutely right. It is really disturbing when you get those. And I can understand, as an elected representative, you're at the receiving end of those two, and you want to do the best for your constituents. Um, we need to improve those, and we need to improve them right now. And we don't need to wait for an evaluation of uh, overall policy and strategy to do that. That work is underway, and it needs to be um, accelerated as fast as we can do it. And I, I uh, appreciate uh, the sentiments you expressed earlier about valid exceptions. Yeah, valid exceptions is a term which is used by those in bureaucracy. Uh, valid exception is a child, a vulnerable child, and every family is affected in a huge way, and every school is affected, particularly a primary school, because so many of them are small, and these children are, are so important to them. In, and I, incidentally, I, I agree with the Minister's decision around the, the issue of inspectorate not going in, because schools are dealing with so yeah. much, and many of us in this room are governors, and we know what schools are dealing with, and we give credit to those in the school estates across the country for the work that they're doing from principles right down. Uh, but in the absence of that evidence, uh, can you assure us that the Department and the EA um, will be able to ensure that the resource that you have currently, and you obviously need more money, but the resource that you have currently will be put to best effect. Sometimes I worry that we have a silo approach. And I think it's the point that was being made earlier a silo approach where there needs to be a joined upness between the department and, and the EA, obviously, but also in terms of communities, in terms of the public health authority, in terms of local government, in terms of the, the, the wider uh, regional government apparatus that is here to ensure that there is value for money, no duplication, no wastage, and that the maximum amount of money is being spent to address the issues that these young people face. Yeah. Can I go back to the valid exception point? I mean, I thought about that, and the analogy that came to me was it seemed to me it was used as a get out of jail free card. And it created an excuse to allow things to drift. Yeah. Um, we have addressed that in the draft code of practice, in that um, even under the new arrangements where there are valid exceptions, we have put upper time limits for those so that they won't be allowed to drift. Now, going back to the substance of your question, um, <laughs> you're asking me to provide you assurance for something that will happen in the future, and I made the point at the start that I won't be around. What I can give you an assurance of is, and it's the point that I made, I do believe there is an absolute commitment on the part of the Minister on the part of the departmental officials and Ricky and his team and in Sarah Long and her team that we all need to do much better in this space, that the new code of practice and the regulations and the various reports by others like the Children's Commissioner and everybody else gives us an opportunity to reset this and commit to doing better and make sure that um, we are properly joined up. And I think we have made great progress in joining up with health and social care. There's no doubt about that. The arrangements that have been put in place are working so much better than they used to. And that we need, because of the financial pressures, that we need to make sure that every pound we spend in this is spent effectively. We can only commit to best endeavours on that. And I'm happy to do that on behalf, albeit, of my successor. Can I just, um, finally, in terms of um, directing resources to children without statement? Yeah. Um, obviously, your budgets are continually under pressure, and I, I know the minister, and I know the minister because I've spoken to him many times about this. He's hugely supportive of trying to do all he can uh, to ensure that these issues are addressed. But money is always a pressure. Uh, and I'm reassured by the answer you gave me uh, uh, just a moment ago in terms of that joint upness and, and greater effectiveness across government. And I, I hope that is the case, and I, I don't doubt your, 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 your words on that. Um, but to maximise that effectiveness, because early intervention is better for the child, yep. for the family, for everyone involved, but it's also cheaper. Um, so therefore, can we... Can, for those children not stimulated, can we be assured that there will be the resource there to address yeah. their needs as well? Yeah. 
number of points there. I, I mentioned earlier, obviously the Minister is mindful of the value of early intervention, and that can take place in all kinds of ways. Uh, for example, the Minister's recent announcement on a whole new suite of nurture units, and we do want to roll that out. Nurture units have been thoroughly evaluated, and they are high impact, relatively low cost. And it is something, hopefully, that would avoid the need for special needs intervention later on. The Education Authority is already looking at, I mean, another of my big problems, obviously, has been the budget and overspends by the Education Authority, um, which the Auditor, has the Auditor General has reported on. Now, the Education Authority is in the process, and Sarah can speak more about it, but there is a commitment to a financial recovery plan in the Education Authority when it is looking at all of its services, all of its pupil support services, um, and to see how it can get all of those back on an even keel, so that it not only is living within budget, but it is spending its money wisely, and there, there is an absolute commitment to that. Um, so I think, in terms of, you know, um, budgetary responsibility, and making sure that every penny we spent is well spent, um, there is no question of a commitment to that from the minister right down through to the education authority, and we can commit to doing our very best on that front. Can I just say that um, I welcome that because that that is uh, something that will be a reassurance to members. Um, I remember when I first got elected to this place, dealing with uh, a mother who came to me distraught because she had a, a battle to get her son into a mainstream school mm. because of uh, he required special educational needs. She won that battle, and I was privileged to support her in that. That young man went to a mainstream school. He successfully completed his AS levels and his A levels. He was deputy head boy of that school and he's currently in university. I want to see more young people have that opportunity. And I'm glad that we're all in the same place and wanting to make sure that's the case. Can I just say, before bringing all our members in, around the issue of nurture units, as a governor of a school where there's a nurture unit at Edenbrook, uh, and I'm aware of others in my constituency like Curry. And I'm welcoming the, the, the establishment of Glenwood. I have to say, nurture units really are invaluable to schools, many of those schools that are in the most, most difficult, deprived, and hard to reach communities. So I, I welcome that. Can, can I make just a couple of points, Chair, uh, on your point on our, the need for early intervention? And again, I refer back to the new code of practice and the new arrangements. I mean, one of the things that will be put in place is the role of the learning support coordinator. Now, it's analogous to the current SENCOS, but one of the big changes is that we will require preschool provision, statutory nurseries, to have a learning support coordinator. And that is a reflection of the importance of early intervention at the preschool stage so that we can deal with problems as early as possible. And another point, again, on providing support for people with young people with special needs in mainstream schools. Um, one of the transformation projects um, I referred to earlier uh, in the transformation program is about greater agility in area planning. Now, area planning is about right school, right, pla right place, right size, um, but it can be a bureaucratic and slow process. So if a school wants to establish a learning support centre, this is a mainstream school or an autism support centre, we've got to go through the full development proposal um, process, which is slow, bureaucratic. And actually, by coincidence, I think it's tomorrow we are going to issue for consultation a proposal for being much more agile in that. So we don't have to go through the development proposal process so that we can put in place very quickly, if the need is there, a learning support centre, an autism support centre in mainstream schools without the full panoply of development proposal bureaucracy around it. So, you know, there is stuff that is going on to improve the experience of young people in mainstream schools. So we can have more examples of the one that you quoted. And just a final statistic, you know, over a period, the proportion of young people with special education needs leaving school, going to higher education, to university, has increased from 10% to over 20%. And that is another outcome success story of what is happening as part of SEND provision. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, um, Chair, and thank you both for coming and giving evidence today. Um, I just had a couple of questions, really, I guess, with for a bit of historical context, some of which has been touched on already. Um, most of the um, legal requirements or the legislative basis for special education in Leeds came out of the 2016 Act, or the, you know, the current provisions that exist. Apologies, I'm kind of using you to do my background research. Whenever that legislation was in preparing it, was there um, what was the expectation? Were there forecasts set out in terms of expectation of need and cost? No. The Act itself would not have gone down into the detail of either cost or anticipated need. Um, sorry, we're going to, no, 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 we're going right, to come back. Right, I'll let you finish <laughs> your answer. There. Um, because that is a fluid thing. Need is changing all the time. The nature of what is presenting at schools is changing all the time. The complexity of what is presenting all the time. So that wasn't in the Act. Now, the Act would have been prepared in the knowledge of what the, uh, the trajectory of special education needs was. I mean, I think it was mentioned in the Audit Office report that back in an old code of practice, 22 years ago, there was a figure of 2%, an assumption of 2% of the school population might require a statement. Well, that is long obsolete, and it is not used as a planning document. So we didn't prescribe in the 2016 Act or anything around that what we thought the actual level of need would be, or indeed what the level of funding would be. That is an operational thing that would come after the fact of the legislation. It was 2% when, sorry? Oh, that was, sorry, 1998. That was an old code of practice, but it's long since gone. It's not used as a planning figure. Uh, but once upon a time, that was a reasonable assumption. But the, the now nearly 20%. No, no, no sorry, that was the 2% was the proportion of children who need a statement. Yep. It's currently 5.5% of the school yeah. population. Okay, and um, you said in discussing some of the findings around financial sustainability, you talked about um, you talked about. Um, how, uh, I mean, relative to England, Northern Ireland had had its spending on schools had been constrained. Obviously, in the austerity year, school spending in England has been ring fenced, I suppose, uh, whereas it hasn't here. Because if we're spending, we now have 311 million, is what's being spent in 1920 on SEN. I'm aware, obviously, we've been in the bands for the last few years. Our budgetary processes, I also, the Finance Committee, have been in chaos. When was the, the last? long-term budgeting exercise done by the department, either as part of a, something mandated by the Department of Finance or just as an internal exercise? I'm afraid for the last six years we have had annual budgets and we have had no ability to do any long-term budgeting exercise on anything and there's no way to plan anything. Um, I have to say, and that's just a beef as an accounting officer, mm -hmm. we have had uh, six years of annual budgets for one reason or another. And against that backdrop, it is extremely difficult to do any kind of long-term planning, um, which um, is a problem. Uh, we had hoped that the next budget would be a three-year budget, but uh, to our dismay, I heard the Chancellor of the Exchequer say a couple of weeks ago that maybe we're looking into another one-year budget, which is not ideal. So there's never been, and I do say this in a... This is not a gotcha thing. I'm just trying to find it. There has never been a, an exercise done where you looked at the long-term trajectory of forecasting SEN costs. Well, we, we can look ahead <coughs> and estimate what we think SEN will cost, but um, you're doing that in a vacuum because you don't know what your budget will be. For example, I mentioned earlier that as we look to the implementation of the new code of practice and all the arrangements around that and the new regulations, we can estimate what we think it will cost to free up the time of the new um, learning support coordinators in each and every school in Northern Ireland, and we can put a price on that. We do know what the um, pupil support services in the education authority cost. So we can actually make an estimate of what we think SEN will cost, mm. but we can't do it in the context of knowing what our budget is and what proportion of our budget that will consume. Because we, you know, at this stage, where are we? Middle of October, moving towards the end of October. We do not know what our budget will be from April 2021, unfortunately. 
And would you have done that exercise? You, you, you said it is possible to make an estimate of same cost. Would you have? Would that have been done in sixteen when the legislation was passed? Um, I can't answer that question because I wasn't around then, and that's a cop out. I know, and I should be able to answer that question. I think the answer is probably no. But I'll defer, well, Ricky wasn't around then either, so I might have to come back to you on that specific point, um, Chair. We'll, we'll give you two weeks to come back. You'll give me two <laughs> weeks. If it's longer than two weeks, I'll be away. If I may, Chair, <laughs> do you think there's, on this question about financial sustainability and the overall cost of special educational needs, like others here, I have had correspondence from I think an ongoing bit of casework around uh, someone whose child has very acute uh, and severe needs, which are bluntly not only not being met, but she's facing very significant difficulty in managing the process and getting straight answers from EA. Um, would you, this is a statement I'm asking you to either endorse or reject. Do you think if there was there had been better forecasting of the cost implications of SEN overall and a more long-term strategic management look at what those costs were that there would be um, less presentation of a, like acute crisis challenges with people who are unable to get the right uh, they're unable to get the right um, uh, support for their children because there seems to be a kind of crisis in, in resource and, and it's become a bit whack-a-mole and it's become a bit random who gets resource and who doesn't and it seem it can seem this may be unfair that sometimes whether um, a person in an area gets their child the need that, that a gets a, a, a an adequate process and B gets their child the support they need is about the resource at that moment in that area do you think it would be that would be it would have been handled better if there had been a long-term look at the costs intuitively the answer to that question is yes um, but I would make the point that much of special education needs is demand-led. So in that respect, um, the resource requirements, the service requirements come at you, and you can't always anticipate what's going to come. But you do have to respond. And if um, following the provision of a statement, which is a statutory instrument, um, you have to respond. You have to pay out whether you have the budget or not which is you know, partly why the Education Authority has found its budget under so much pressure. I'll answer your question a different way. I think if the Education Authority had had better management processes in place and better management information in place, they could have provided a better service to many of those people that you have described. And I think that's evidenced by the fact that having shone a light on their own internal deficiencies, and credit to them for doing that, they have managed dramatically to reduce waiting times for statements over the course of the last 12 months. And they have done that through their own activities. And I suppose the obvious you know, response to that is, why wasn't it done mm. earlier? And I've already held my own hand up and said, I should have probed that issue more robustly earlier myself. Okay. Mr. Harvey. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Irwin. I'm led to believe that 20% more children here have special educational needs compared to the rest of GB. What explanation could be given for that? I'm not altogether sure it's 20% more. I mean, the proportion of the school population in Northern Ireland that has special needs is 13.8%. In England, um, and in Scotland, they have a very different definition, so it's hard to compare with Scotland. In England, it's 12.1%. So there's a 1.7 percentage difference between ourselves and England. Um, now, when you ask why would a higher proportion of children here have special needs than in England, I don't have an answer to that. And I have asked many people, people who are experts, and I'm not an expert, and they don't know. Now, there are some empirical facts that you can point to. The incidence of autism here, the diagnosis of autism among school children here is twice the rate that it is in England. And obviously autism will feed through to special needs. Not in every case, 
but in large measure it will feed through. Now, I have no explanation as to why the incidence of autism is higher. You would need to ask health professionals. I suspect they might not have an answer. But there are other factors as well that will play into special needs, particularly issues around behavioural, emotional difficulties, attachment difficulties of young people. We have higher levels of poverty at a general level and child poverty than exist in England. Um, we have the legacy of the Troubles in Northern Ireland, which is cross-generational and can impact in particular areas. We have higher levels of mental health problems than they have in England. So all of those will play through to the problems experienced by families and by young people, and it will manifest themselves in special needs. But I can't give you a direct cause and effect link, and that is me maybe commenting anecdotally. But I have asked many professionals why the incidence would be higher, and those are the kinds of factors that they present. Ricky, would you want to add to that? Well, just that I think there's further research that needs to be done to really understand uh, those um, aspects that Derek has uh, alluded to there and understand the interplay between them and then how we need, in terms of policy and funding, to be able to respond to that in the future. Yeah, a mixture of factors. I noticed that, uh, um, and you did mention it there, 2010-2011 to 2017-18, uh, the results achieved by children leaving with special needs uh, statement there's more leaving with a good qualification and less leaving with none. Yeah. I mean, that's a good result. I mean, that's... That, that is an excellent outcome. And I think more importantly, buried within those figures is that the gap is closing yeah. between those with special needs and those who don't have special needs. And all of that is down to the quality of teaching and learning that goes on in our schools and the work of uh, teachers, classroom assistants and school leaders. There's a steady improvement. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Flynn, uh, who is joining us from St by Starleaf, do you wish to ask a question? Oh. Yes, please, sure. Um, thank you. I suppose everything, most of the, the, the key issues have been covered by um, the other members. Um, so I, I suppose I just I would rather make more of an observation rather than a question. Um, and all the answers that you gave, Derek. Um, there's obviously a lot to be um, hopeful um, from some of the things that you're talking about, some of the, the improvements that are already being made, um, which is all great. But I suppose, you know, the the um, the reason behind this session today and for ourselves, we're basing, um, we're basing our questions and our queries on the most recent audit report that I suppose is still saying that the recommendations that were made in 2017 haven't been implemented. So although it is encouraging to hear about all the great work that's being done, um, I suppose the worry is that, you know, we're not coming back to this in a couple of years' time. Um, and I know that earlier when um, a couple of the members questioned just around that um, that issue of previous recommendations that haven't, haven't been fully implemented um, in the past number of years, and I know that you had the issues, obviously, with the, the in, inspectorate authority um, who, who couldn't carry out that piece of work. Um, and the schools were obviously reminded about the code of practice. I mean, I don't know, was that something, was that a letter or an email that was sent from the department to remind schools about the code of practice? Is that as far as things went around that piece of work from 2017? Um, and I'm just wondering, does the department have a designated person who is, you know, going to hold on to this this most recent audit report to make sure that you don't see the slippage that we've seen from 2017. But I am encouraged to hear about all the progress that's being made, and obviously with the consultation that the ministers published as well. That's all. That's all good news. Okay. Um, does the department have a person? That would be Ricky, um, and my successor. And um, that's the short answer to that. Um, and a point I would make, um, I mean, it, I think a general observation is that many of the deficiencies identified by the Audit Office, and quite rightly identified by the Audit Office in its reports, are, I hope, covered in the new Code of Practice, which, as I say, I wouldn't expect you to have read because it's several hundred pages long, but they are picked up 
and addressed in that code of practice. Sorry, I lost you there for a moment. Uh, are picked up in that code of practice. So I think that's the important point that I would make in response to your observation. Yeah, I mean, just in terms of some of the actions, uh, it, it is more, of course, than just a letter that went to schools in June 18. It's yeah, also the training that's been going on for the last couple of years with principals uh, and Senkos. We also reviewed the SEN categories in terms of um, SEN and medical um, distinctions, uh, and there was training provided and guidance provided to schools on that. And then, of course, as Derek has said, the ETI carried out a best practice um, phase one evaluation, and the results of that have been shared. Um, with schools and now, of course, the consultation. So there's been quite a lot of action around um, all of those uh, recommendations. Okay. Uh, okay. All members have had uh, an opportunity to ask questions in the first round. Um, I uh, calm, calm. Um, I, and so, therefore, there are a couple of members who have asked to make very short, brief, second comments, Mr. Hillich. Sorry, Chair, jumped the comment. It was just on recommendation four, and I've obviously been very much looking at the, the blame culture that was that, that was afoot. The relationship now with the Department of Health, who were getting some of the blame for the previous delays, has that box now been picked at recommendation four? We have had very good cooperation with our health colleagues, both at departmental level and at individual trust level. As I said earlier, each trust now has a special education needs coordinator, a single point of contact to make sure that when the education authority needs advice for a statement, it's allocated to the right person, it's chased up. We have better electronic transmission of data. That might seem a small thing in this day and age, but actually confidential health records moving outside the health service is a difficult issue. We have streamlined the nature of the information that we request from all of these health and social care professionals to make it easier both for them and both their staff and the education authority to interpret them. So the short answer to that is yes. Ricky has been involved in the sharp end of some of that cooperation. Ricky, do you want to add anything? I mean, just over the last few months, obviously, with COVID, the interaction between health and education has been very challenging. But in terms of the compliance rates, uh, health are required to provide their medical advices in relation to statutory assessment within six weeks. So they've been able to um, reach a 77% compliance rate during the COVID period, which is actually um, very good, and putting them in a good position in terms of when the new SEN framework comes in and the shorter time frame uh, is introduced. So we've definitely seen an improvement in the cooperation and collaboration between health and education and each of the trusts with the EA. Okay, thank you. And post-COVID then, uh the, the level of in, the inspector that was to be increased and in better expertise, that has been found. And how will the inspections then be taken forward? Uh, would it be just the one-off visit or with paper exercise, uh, which is prepared beforehand, or is it with continual engagement? No, no. Um, well, obviously, on an individual school inspection, the uh, inspector will make sure that there's special education needs expertise in there, and they've recruited additional associate inspectors. Those are people who are maybe teachers out there. They're not on the full-time <coughs> inspector staff, but they can deploy them. They have had a few special education needs experts return to them who had been off, and they are recruiting, I think, as we speak, another SEN <coughs> expert. Um, but in terms of the wider evaluation of SEN practice out there at a, an overall system level, the plans for that are drawn up. They will investigate 50 schools. It won't be a paper exercise. They will go into the schools and see what the practice is, identify what works, and so forth. They will look at the progress of it's all about the progress of individual pupils on the basis of the interventions in those schools. So it won't be a paper exercise. It'll be in schools. Thanks, Mr. McHugh. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, just in relation to uh, your answer to a question from the Chair uh, with regards to um, early intervention, and uh, you commented that in nursery supervision and so on, that there would be a learning support coordinator yeah, for uh, statutory, statutory nurseries. Yes. Yeah. Is it only statutory nurseries? And I say that with the vested interest oh, okay. the of, uh, of an e school uh, that isn't statutory as such. Uh, at this stage, it's only statutory because they're the only ones that we could legislate for. We couldn't legislate for private uh, or voluntary preschool provision. Ricky, am that, I right in saying that? that? that that's correct. Grant, grant aided um, schools. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. 
That's something you'll have to lobby for in your work as an yeah. MLA. Of course, you can't do that here. Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for your responses this afternoon. Um, obviously, you're retiring in two weeks' time. I just want to have an understanding of what the arrangements will be going forward, obviously, in the absence of a permanent secretary once you retire, and obviously, we'll get a replacement in terms of especially the special education needs steering group, and he's going to oversee that, because some of this here is a collective failure on behalf of the Department of Education and also the Education Authority. And the, the real need for governance and oversight of the education authority. So, what are the arrangements going to be in place going forward? Okay. Well, the it was the minister who asked the permanent secretary to chair the uh, the steering group, and that will remain. In terms of the logistics of replacing me, happily, that's not my responsibility. That's the responsibility of the Department of Finance. And I think a competition will be launched very, very shortly. So you can dust on your CV if you wish, and uh, that will be out there very soon. And I would hope there will be a replacement in place quite soon. Thanks, but no thanks. But in terms of <laughs> the SEN steering group, who's going to oversee that then, in the absence of a permanent secretary? Well, my, I have a deputy who is in charge of this area. It's actually Ricky's boss. And if there are any meetings of the SEN steering group during that interregnum, it will hopefully only be for a few weeks. Okay, so we're not talking about a long period. Pending a competition reaching a conclusion, my deputy secretary will chair that that uh, SEN steering group for that period. But that might only be for one. One meeting, I would hope. Thank you. Just for your forbearance, Chair. Um, obviously, a lot of us are all getting the memories back in March when the first set set of restrictions came down in terms of COVID with school closures and business restrictions happening again. And I can recall back then where there was children with you know, challenging behaviours and complex needs, and there was real fa feeling by the parents and by the young people themselves that they were failed by the education system in the first wave. We're now going into the second wave of COVID-19. We're seeing increased restrictions. We're seeing things that have to be taken. What assurances can be given that those children will not be forgotten in the, the second wave of COVID-19? Yeah, I mean that was a real. I, I do have to point out to members: yeah. this is about this report, with great respect. So. That is straying off the report, so I'm, I'm going to not allow that to be okay. asked. With respect, Mr. Boylan. Thanks for letting me in, Chair. Just Derek, and <clears> you know, you're leaving in two weeks, and, and I wish you well. But just I take the opportunity to ask this question in terms of the two reports. Firstly, 26. Where would we have been if we hadn't have carried if these two reports I hadn't been carried out in terms of the overall system itself? Well, I actually th the with or without these reports. The minister would have been pushing ahead with new SEN regulations on the foot of the 2016 Act and the new Code of Practice. So many of the issues that were picked up in the 2017 report and followed through were already covered in the Code of Practice, but obviously we couldn't progress with a statutory Code of Practice in the absence of an Assembly because it is a statutory process. So I think a lot of them would have been addressed anyway. And you will see that, you know, if you ever get round to reading the draft code of practice, all of the issues that are covered in it. But I do think the audit office reports play a really important part in concentrating everybody's minds. But there are others who won't let us um, sit on our hands on these issues. I mentioned earlier that the Children's Commissioner produced a really important report in March of this year and identified 40 recommendations for improvements in SEN. And that was a really valuable report because it looked at all of the issues through the eyes of parents and teachers and indeed the staff who work in delivering the services and their frustrations. So there was a human side to it. So there's plenty of people holding our feet to the fire in this issue, with or without the audit office, but it does help. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, members, I have been um uh, quite lenient today, and normally, as you know, I'm, I'm not. But given the import of this this um, issue, uh, I want to thank all members for the, for the questions that they they asked, and and to you both for your your answers. Um, I take it no other member has any other issue you want to raise before we finish the session. Okay, and Mr. Donnelly and Mr. Stevenson, is there anything you wish to add or ask of our guests this afternoon? Uh, Chair, of nothing to add at, at this point. Thank okay. you, Mr. Stevenson. Nothing from the Department of Finance perspective, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Well, look, gentlemen, thank you very, both very much indeed. Um, I know you're going to remain and, and might be here for a sweep up, but if not, and I thank you both very much for your time taken today. Uh, thank you both very much um, for your candour. 
Uh, I think it's important that, that that was the case today. And Derek, very personally, can I thank you uh, for your work in the Department of Education over the last number of years. It has been very helpful to me in my constituency work in terms of young people in North Belfast across the community in North Belfast, and that has been crucial and critical. Those interventions have made a real difference to many young people's lives. So thank you very much, and I am sure all their members would share that in terms of their constituencies as well. I take it after you finish these two weeks, you won't be putting in for the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, Joe. I certainly will not, Chair. <laughs> 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 uh, members, members to, to allow the room to be prepared for our <laughs> next guest, uh, we're going to take a short uh, break. Okay, and Thank we you, will. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Under Assembly, Senate Chamber. Okay, members, we are now in open session, and uh, I would like at this stage to invite Sarah Long, Chief Executive of the Education Authority, Ms Una Turbot, Interim Director for Children and Young People, who will now come and give evidence to the committee, and then members will be asked and invited to ask questions. Okay, um, can I, Sarah and Una, uh, welcome you to the meeting this afternoon. You are very welcome, uh, and I know you know how this works. So, if you want to make an opening statement, and then members will ask questions. So, over to you. Okay, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, just to say, Chair, that we fully accept um, the Northern Ireland Audit Office report. We welcome that it validates our own um, internal report that was carried out during November of 2019, and that it builds on the report from the Northern Ireland Children's Commissioner. Um, I have been clear from the outset that this is not an acceptable standard of service delivery, and I have apologised for that. Um, so we have put in place an immediate action plan to make uh, some priority improvements, but we are also developing an overarching programme approach to ensuring that the recommendations of all of these reports can be met and can be met in a, in a prompt way. And we will do that alongside our key stakeholders, our children, and parents. Okay. Mr. Hildage. Thanks, Jordan. You're very welcome this afternoon. Uh, looking at the report, it is obviously very concerning to the lay person and, and some through it together with uh, sort of all our knowledge in the area within this four walls here. It, it really gives an overview to me anyway of a, a poor and this has been back obviously sometime as well, a poor leadership and governance. Uh, there appeared to be a blame culture uh, and approach. The, the old civil service culture of living from day to day, week to week, just to get by, uh, failure to deal with change, and even, as I said, within these four walls of this building, I have heard on a number of occasions in relation to potential bullying. What would you say to those sort of allegations? I know you are trying your best to move forward, but those issues have been thrown out there. As, as issues, what would, way would you take those or talk to them? Um, what I would say is the um, audit of practice that the EA conducted itself in November 2019 did identify a range of issues in terms of how staff were working day to day. And as a result of that, um, it was difficult for them to manage in a proactive way, and that was often done in a reactive way. Um, it talked about examples of good practice being based on individual members of staff um, who were doing their best despite the circumstances, and it did talk about a lack of a, uh, accountability and performance um, culture in the services. Would that not warrant a, an independent investigation or overview of the situation within EA? So, a, an investigation has commenced. Within the EA, it has commenced. Independent. Um, it, is, it is being overseen by a, a board committee, um, and the investigation. The EA board committee. Yes, and the investigation. So it's not independent. Then? It's, being, it's being taken. It's being undertaken by two independent investigators. Okay. Uh, going, going to some of the specifics, then the uh, the decision making statement. Obviously, there had been long delays over a period of time, and some horrific figures. Out there, could, could you tell us how the process one actually works, just step by step, until who makes that final decision? Okay, I'm actually going to ask you now. 
Yeah, that's the the is a um, obviously we have to stay within a code of practice, okay? And there are different steps. So the first I propose the step is that a child is identified potentially as having um, a special educational need, and that can initially be addressed in the school as part of stage one or stage two, um, stage three part of the code where the school um, uses whatever resources it has it's, um, within that setting to meet the needs of the child. If, the, if there is concern that the needs of the child can't be met within the school setting, then referrals are made through to the education authority and that is through the statutory operations team. So those referrals comes, come in at that point and a decision is made then whether or not a statement um, will be, uh, whether a, a statutory assessment then will be, con will be conducted. Um, if that is the case then a range of professionals then provide advice to the statutory um, operations team and from that then a decision is made um, in terms of the nature of the, the statement, what's what's in that statement and how the, children, the child's needs can be met. Mm -hmm. And who makes that final st statement? Is there a committee, a board? Or? No, it's, it's, the, the, it, it's done actually by the statementing team. Um, there is uh, an officer who is assigned to each of the cases and they will look at all of the advices that are coming in. So it's advice from educational psychologists for example, who play a particular role, who will, who will outline very clearly um, what the needs of the child um, are and make recommendations as to the type of provision that the child will need. There will be other advices coming in, for example, from a speech and language therapist, an occupational therapist, um, paediatricians, and all of that advice then um, is taken into consideration and a, and a statement is drafted. Mm -hmm. And from that then, a decision is, is made in terms of the the actual provision, but it, it is dependent very much on the advice that's coming in from those professional groups. Yes, uh, a team is the word I was looking for, but it's not like the old EB, ELBs where there were sort of five different decision-making groups and created an inconsistency throughout Northern Ireland. Are you happy there's more consistency now? Um, I, I think we certainly have a road to grow, you know, to go in terms of achieving consistency. But what we have done um, recently is we have put a process in place for the statutory operations teams, so that all five offices are all doing exactly the same and adhering to the same standards. Okay, no, that, that's good. The other issue then at the minute would be in relation to the appeals. Uh, there does appear to be some uh, fairly worrying figures on the appeals, whereby. Uh, I think it was around. We were hoping for around 50 per cent, and it turned out it was very. There was much more. But surely there's something uh, sort of systematic way wrong with, with what's going on at that level of appeals. And I think you actually gave up quite a percentage of appeals before you even got to a hearing stage and whatnot. But what, what's going on there? Does that not point us really in the in the direction of, of what really is going on? And just. In terms of the appeals, that was again something that the audit of practice that we conducted in 2019 highlighted um, and highlighted concerns around the numbers of appeals and the percentage of appeals that were mm -hmm. conceded. And it recommended that a lessons learned exercise would be undertaken. Mm -hmm. really. like they've travelled in the last couple of three years here, so Tra it, it was 145 to 408. Yes, so we do need to, we do need to understand the trends, and we do need to understand the systemic reasons for that, which uh -huh. I think is what you've said is absolutely right. And you've actually conceded 68 per cent of just found the figures here at the minute, which again really points you to a worry as to what is really going on. So we, we are reviewing that as part of the overall improvement plan for the statutory operations service um, that's, that was developed immediately after the audit of practice and will form part of our overarching programme approach. There is no doubt we need to really understand why this is happening and what are the trends behind that and how do we stop that from happening. And was it this report drew your attention to it or were you aware of it before? The audit of practice that we under took um, drew our attention to it, but this report certainly confirmed and reinforced that view yeah. for us. So the actions you're taking is on the back of this report? We're taking further action on the back of this of report. The back of this report, so you weren't doing anything? No, we were doing something. We were, yes, on the back of the audit of practice in 2019. Um, we were undertaking a lessons learned, but I think we need to go further on the back of this report. Right, I think looking at the figures is definitely 
definitely need to go further. Uh, I understand that in September 19, the NAO England published a report on SEN which highlights significant concerns in relation to SEN throughout local authorities in England. Uh, what comparisons, comparisons have been done by the Education Authority in relation to some of the types of common issues with SEN that have been identified in other jurisdictions? So, um, whenever I came into post in April 2019, that was something that our board were keen that we would understand and try and learn from other jurisdictions as well. Um, during the course of 2019, I had commenced um, conversations with the Local Government Association, um, and they represent all of the local authorities and undertake peer review for special educational needs um, services. Peer review is a well-known, well-understood and evidence-based review in which um, officers from local authorities in England would come over and review our services in a, in a, a very clearly set out and defined way. Um, and then officers from the EA would join review teams in England. Those and did the English authorities give you a report? To that hasn't taken place seen? yet. So those, those discussions um, d d d weren't completed. We were due originally. We had an, a, a date set for April of this year, but obviously that couldn't go forward. And uh, in truth, I haven't progressed any further discussions about picking that up until we're in a position to actually do so. Mm -hmm. And would you be aware of them? If there are systemic issues that are being reported in Northern Ireland, which are common in other areas? I think um, there are some issues that are common and there are some issues that we need to address ourselves. So the issues of process, etc. Um, for us, I think we really need to attend to ourselves. I think some of the common issues are around need, the identification of need, um, delivery of services um, at the early intervention stage, um, and the um, statementing process itself and making it a more child-centred and less administrative process. Okay. Are there even common issues which are reflective here, in, are, are here? Common issues we have here in Northern Ireland, are they even reflected in other areas or other jurisdictions? Yes. Yes? Yes. Yes. We won't elaborate on that? Or? Um, I think, as I've said, they're around some of the processing, some of the identification and need, um, also the ability to, to um, demonstrate the outcomes um, at a population level. I know that certainly that's something that England have just commissioned a longitudinal study on, um, and the Republic of Ireland have just commenced. Okay. Chair, sure, I'll, I'll leave it there. I have other questions, but I don't want to talk them all. There's other members to ask you. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and I do want to thank you for coming here today in the midst of everything else and the challenges that schools and the education authority are, are facing, so it, it is appreciated. Um, um, I think I've joined the Public Accounts Committee just recently, and I was reading through the Northern Ireland Audit Office report in relation to special educational needs and the previous one. I would have to sadly say that, that the findings in that were no surprise to me because I've met the parents and the young people who have been affected by this. Um, I've also, and I appreciate you're in the post relatively recently as Chief Executive, but I've had dealings with the Education Authority over many years, and I don't say this lightly, but I've found it to be the most dysfunctional organisation ever to encounter. Um, I understand that there's a corner to be turned in relation to this, but what's happened here and what the findings from these reports are make clear that young people and children have been failed. And what I'm looking for is an assurance from you that you have the the confidence that a corner is being turned, and particularly in relation to the whole issue in terms of how you actually get a statement on stage three, where there's really a real finding of a backlog there, and what efforts are being made to address that. Um, thank you. Yes, I, I am absolutely determined that we will make improvements in this area in particular and in other areas, but in this area in particular, it is a priority for me um, and a priority for our corporate leadership team and our board who fully support and endorse what we are doing in this area. Um, so yes, I, I, I can give you an assurance that we are turning a corner. I think we have a way to go. Some of these issues, as you have described, are systemic in nature and will take us some time and may take additional resource to um, actually get to the point where we need to be. <coughs> um, and I don't underestimate that either. But we are turning a corner and we need to start with benchmarking those services at stage three and really understanding what the current 
demand for those services are and what our capacity to meet them is and then also how do children access those services so that is has to be our starting point in terms of, of stage three at the minute we know schools tell me there is unmet need there is unmet need held at school level i'm not sure that we yet have a complete picture about what the actual need is and therefore what capacity we may need to um we may need to do to um to resolve that what i would say is we also need to continue our work with the statutory operations piece. That is a statutory requirement, and it's not an either or, as Una reminds me all the time. And we really need to ensure that we do both. But we've got to start with really understanding what the need for the stage three services is, because I don't believe we have that full picture yet. I understand that and appreciate that. <clears throat> is there time scales for this? Because this is the first, this is the thing that parents and the young people will come to you. When are we going to turn that corner? When are we going to see a change where we're not going to get another audit office report saying that some recommendations haven't been implemented? When are we going to have a situation where things are going to be fit for purpose? Because that's the aspiration I think we all want to, to, to go towards. So we do have, as I said, an immediate improvement in plan in place, which is very much based around the statutory operations and the office processes and how we can move those forward. <coughs> Uh, in terms of our programme approach, we are establishing a stakeholder reference group um, with, with that uh, programme because I, like you, have heard the negative feedback and I believe we really need to build and restore the confidence of the system in this organisation and in the services that we provide. Um, and so we're very keen that we develop this programme with our stakeholders and we do that through co-design. So in terms of the actual timescales and development of the full plan, that's not yet complete because we're, we want to do that as, as a co-design piece of work. We hope that that will be completed by the end of this year. That does not mean that work doesn't continue with the improvements and the immediate improvement plan that is in place, but it, it is really important to us that we start to rebuild our relationships with parents and with stakeholders and re regain confidence. If I, if I could come in there, just in relation to specific targets, we obviously um, found ourselves in, a, in, a, in a, a difficult situation where we had so many um, children waiting for such long times for um, their provision, for their statements to be issued and for the provision to be, to be in place for them, which is actually what the ultimate goal is in relation to providing children with, with support. What we have done is, we, I suppose, in, the, in this last six months, we have made significant inroads in terms of the progress that has been made in reducing those 26-week and over weights, um, taking into consideration that, we, that, that, the, that the data that we're presenting to you is, includes the valid exceptions that we are not taking into account whenever we're giving you that information. But our hope is, and we, are, we know it's a challenging target, but we are hoping to have the 26-week the um, target met um, and, and including the valid exceptions by the end of March. Now we do know, and I'm, I'm, I'm urgent, you know, caution. It's a stretching target, but we are absolutely committed to delivering from, um, on, in that regard. Um, and, and going to your point, it is about listening to parents and making sure that we are working with them to make sure that we are getting the right provision in place for the children um, that desperately need us to do this. Just one more question, and conscious other members will have questions. Just around the valid exceptions. How confident are you that those are valid, if I may say? Because one of the concerns is that the valid exceptions is used as a way to evade, evade the target and also to add, um, is that I understand you are part of a jigsaw, so the Department of Education is a key part of this, and also there are also different parts of the health service in terms of th this role, and how confident are you in terms of being supported as part of that jigsaw? So in relation to the valid exceptions, that's why the figures that we are now currently reporting in terms of our percentage compliance against the 26-week standard, we have removed the valid exceptions, so they are raw figures, if you like, because we didn't have the confidence in the valid exception process um, to be able to um, use the information then we had as a means of, of allowing us to manage the service and make sure that we're tracking children through the service in the most appropriate way. There is a piece of work underway now, as you describe, around making sure, as, as we in shorthand say, that the valid exceptions really are valid. Um, and that work is underway. Um, and we hope to be able to apply the valid exceptions again before the end of this calendar year. 
but it, 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 it results in a, in a deterioration in our performance against the, um, 20, the percentage of the 26-week standard, but it is really at this point in time what I would say the only true way to be able to do this, and I think it is more important we do that and improve the service than we chase if you like, an enhanced performance target. So this is about what we do for those children who are waiting the longest time. So we have made a very clear and deliberate decision to do that. In terms of the relationship with health, um, I think uh, Ricky described in the previous session, we have a good working relationship with health and certainly um, COVID has, has enhanced that for us. Um, one of the things that the audit of practice in 2019 picked up was that um, valid exceptions were being applied while we were waiting for health advices, but then we were not proactively following up those health advices. And so while it was seen as, oh, there's a valid exception for health, and therefore it's not for us to attend to, it most certainly was for us to attend to, we both have a responsibility in that space. Um, and so again, that's something that we're working with health yeah. on. Um, but at this point in time, education and health are, are meeting twice weekly. Um, let's be clear, and we are covering a full range of issues. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, Mr. O'Toole. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, one of the things that um, I think emerged from the report is that when the 2017 report happened, there, there basically wasn't within EA a dedicate a team which had which had clear ownership of addressing the findings of the 2017 report. Is that, does that chime with your experience when you took over? There was the SEND implementation team in place who did address a number of the recommendations around training, um, etc. But there wasn't a dedicated improvement team in place um, in order to take forward the recommendations, no. But there obviously is now. Yes. And one of the questions, sort of, I guess, broader questions we were asking the department in the previous session was around um, the financial sustainability of the um, special education needs uh, looked at in the context of the, the overarching educational budget in Northern Ireland. Um, how much, from your perspective, do resource constraints, constraints play in terms of the, what you've acknowledged is, is a suboptimal service? I think there is no doubt that resource constraints have, have played a part. I have no doubt about that. But I think there are other areas as well that have played their part in terms of that suboptimal service. Um, so I don't think it's, a, it's a, an, an either or. I think it's both. So there are internal processes that we do need to address and that we, um, we must address. But I think at this stage, if we don't even fully understand what the demand for our service is, it is difficult for us to be assured that we have the correct and appropriate resource to meet that demand. And I think it's very important. That's why I think it's very important that we really get a handle on that. One of the, and you kind of touched on it there, one of the, um, one of the other um, really structural things is around management information. and. Um, and some of this seems to stem from the transition from the old education library boards into a unified education authority. Um, I suppose two questions. One, can you explain your view on management information and um, how bad it is, basically, or how bad it was, what's being done to address it? And secondly, um, are there outstanding challenges in specific legacy offices or areas in, rela in relation to the old education and library boards? For, you know, are there bits basically of Northern Ireland where management information is still being collected in relation to special education and needs less well than other areas? One is about how bad is it, two is it about where, which, areas are still, which areas are still doing badly or doing worst? Okay, so we do now have one regional management information system. Um, what I would say we lack in the Education Authority is um, data analytics expertise around that system. Um, I also think um, we suffered from 
the, the 2019 audit of practice, as I said, described staff working um, uh, in very difficult environments and managing multiple pressures. And in that sort of environment, then what what you find is your your rigor around your data may not always be there as well. So I think it's been a combination of the rigor on input, um, the, the um, absence of, of of any real meaningful data analytics. Um, within um, the Education Authority, um, and I think we didn't have a defined and clear performance framework through which that management's information could be fed and reviewed. And, and then the other part, which is, are there any geographies which are specifically? Um, I wouldn't say geographies. I would say service areas. There still remains, um, and I think the Audit Office report highlighted that, that there are still in, in the stage three <coughs> services, for example, that we're not, we're not clear that we have a consistent and rigorous approach to data management, data quality, and data input. And one of the specific things that came out when we discussed it with um, the Audit Office was that it was as basic as some areas, uh, like when you were talking about data analytics expertise, but some of it is about literally data input. Some areas are using Excel and others are using, I don't know, Sage or something else. What's, is that being addressed? Yes, it is. Yes, it's certainly being addressed at the statutory operations phase, has been addressed at the statutory operations phase. And I think as Una has described, um, COVID has allowed us to take that further again. So it would be the stage three services now that I feel we need to um, get into with the same level of rigour and ensure that we have the same level of consistent data and data quality. And just one final point, if I may, um, Chair. You mentioned lack of data analytics expertise. Does that mean um, there are, as it were, too many kind of um, uh, generous managers who may be very able and diligent, but generous managers without specific data um, data analytic training, or are you, are, are, there a, are, you, are you looking for data scientists to come and work at the EA? What's, what, what is the specific expertise you want, and how are you going to get it? Okay, so at this point in time, um, what I would say is some of the expertise that has been developed has been de developed within individual directorates, and so therefore not necessarily um, delivering in, in a corporate and consistent way. So I think the first the first stage for us has to be to take the staff that we have um, within various directorates and ensure that they can come together collectively and corporately and then decide whatever training um, we might need for those. It's a difficult balance to um, strike, as everyone commented earlier. We know how stretched budgets are and how stretched uh, budgets to schools are. So in that context, I, I do not wish to start to seek to build and recruit um, a, a large corporate centre, but I need to find a way from the resources that I have and the expertise that I do have to maximise that. And, and that's probably through further training and identification of further training. One final tiny point, Chair, and then I'll hand over to those who want to ask. Do you seem to imply there, do, when you talked about not build, you don't want to build a big corporate centre, do you have a general concern that within the EA there is, as it were, too much, is too much management responsibility devolved still to, to regions? Would you like more um, st strategic kind of management authority at the centre? Less, um, less, again, less regions and more um, directorates. And, uh, and it's something I think was mentioned earlier in terms of some of the feedback. The, there has been a huge criticism of the Education Authority that it works in silos mm -hmm. and that it works in five silos of directorates who don't communicate with each other, who don't communicate well with others. I would like um, a more corporate, and, and I'm working towards building, a more corporate oversight of the Education Authority, if you like, through our corporate leadership team, um, our, our corporate governance arrangements and our corporate governance framework that, that we must, by default, work across directorates and that we have a clear corporate um, message around that and, and that we are looking at our information in that way as well, rather than in silos, because when we're looking at our information in silos, we're making decisions only on the basis of that information for that particular directorate and not right across. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Mr McHugh. Dr Rove, uh, <coughs> and you, Rich, you're very welcome today again. Um, 
just in relation to uh, the 2017 report and the very fact that the town recommendations were not implemented, uh, and at that time uh, there was a progress board had been set up. I think it's still in existence, is it? Yeah. Yes. And uh, it, well, it the same board now that wh whilst you have accepted, in fact, um, uh, the deficiencies not within the service at present, it will likely be addressing those same uh, recommendations of the latest report. So the programme board that was set up around the 2017 report was a DE-led um, programme board. What, what I am putting in place within the Education Authority is an overarching programme board to make sure that the recommendations of the full range of reports that have come forward really within the last uh, year um, are, are all implemented. There, there are now so many recommendations. Many of them are interlinking. Many of them overlap. Um, and so what we have to make sure is that we have the right approach um, to all of that um, in interlocking um, sets of recommendations. So I will chair, I will be the SRO of that programme board um, within the EA and as, as chief executive so that I can be assured that the recommendations are being completed in as fulsome a way as possible and that I can show and demonstrate that as well. It's back to my point. I think some of this will take time. I have no doubt about that. But, but again, if we, know what, if we know what time we think it's going to take and we can chart our milestones along the way, I think that will be very important. I think we must begin to demonstrate improvement, not just talk about improvement. We have to be able to show it. It was very good to hear that, that in fact we're talking here about delivery uh, in that respect, rather than just saying, OK, I, we, we know it's there, we know the problem's there, but this time we want to see delivery and that on it. Uh, but going right down there to some of the more personalised type sort of situations that one deals with then as an MLA or as a councillor or as a representative of the general public, that uh, within schools at the present time there's a, a quota of the number of children they can refer to the educational psychologist and so on. And uh, that I think uh, it is the case too that maybe that's to be done away with, is that right? Well, it's certainly going to be reviewed. It's the time allocation model, and that featured heavily in the Northern Ireland Children's Commissioner report. So as part of our overarching programme, um, we will have to review the time allocation model. Um, and it's back to my earlier point as well about the identification of unmet need, because if that need is currently held at school level, I'm not sure how we would ever be in a position to design our services to, to sufficiently need it, meet it, if we don't know what it is. Una, I don't know if you want to. No, I think the certainly the education psychologist team were very um, um, keen to look at the model that they're using. Now, in terms of the children who are requiring statements, those children are being seen. The, de the demand is, and the, the issue seems to be in the stage three, so where you have children who, who psychologists need to be able to support, give advice, support schools with those, though the, the demand there is exceeding the ability of the psychologists to meet that. Um, I haven't said that. What we do need to look at is how psychologists are working and are there other things that they're involved in that they may uh, actually allow other, other um, to do, for example, the Senkos or teachers or, or other, other services within the EA team. So they're looking at that at the minute and obviously very conscious that there's been significant criticism in relation to their time allocation model. I think the time allocation model was set up um, in, a, you know, in, in fairness um, to try and, and to spread the resource that they have across, across the region, um, but it has been difficult. And it also gives rise to sort of the type of common complaint that I am faced with then is that uh, how the schools themselves actually choose who it is that is actually sent along uh, to the psychologist uh, and that. Uh, even to the point of where um, uh, it's believed by parents, rightly or wrongly, in some cases, that there's like a vested interest I, in schools uh, and not having children referred as such. Um, uh, and in particular, when we talk about early intervention, you know, it's so important that we have that facility there for all children um, and uh, uh, so that they are identified at that very, very early stage. Um, uh, the other part that I was thinking of just on that in relation to that, that uh, are, are we reassured even in implementing a new system now that, uh, that um, 
that, that they will all be provided for, all, that they all will be catered for in that situation? I'm not sure that we could say that all would be catered for because that would also be resource dependent. But I think what I would like to be in a position to do is to know what that need is and to know what the gap in the resource is because at this point in time, as I say, without knowing that, I can't articulate that to you <laughs> or to say all needs could be met if I had if I had a, a additional resource of X or Y. So I think, I think to get to that point, it's really important we understand what that need is. And I think that's something I have heard so many times from schools, that how are we even um, trying to design and build the services to even try and meet the need, when actually most of that's held at school level and we don't know what it is. Well, just in making a statement on this rather than a question, that uh, it is the case, you know, um, that. Mothers in particular, very often they know before the child even gets to that school whether or not that need is there. And that then going into them will say, let's say primary school, uh, that whether or not the school makes that kind of provision or has a facility. And that's, if anything, it might create a situation whereby um, it might not be in the school's interest. But the resources needs to be sort of... Um, ensured for them to be able to deliver before statement ever arrives in the first instance. What do you think of that type of comment? Yes, well, I think that's early intervention at its best, and um, yeah. that's certainly... Yeah, I think all of the evidence points towards early intervention. The senior, and, and it's not just intervent, early intervention in relation to individual children, it's early intervention in the whole class. So it's taken a whole school approach, it's taken a whole class approach. Um, you know, we see children, for example, uh, quite a significant number of children who, are, who have statements because they have social and emotional behavioural issues. And we know that, um, that probably some, one of the best ways to actually support those children is to actually do it as part of um, a class um, where their peers are involved in the intervention. Um, and, and that's not to say that we shouldn't, where there are children with particularly challenging difficulties, we need to be able to target those children then and put additional interventions there. But we need to know that the in interventions that we're providing, that they're evidence-based that they're actually going to, you know, they're likely to work, um, and we need to get them in as early as possible. And I do want to reiterate, I think the 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 nurture program um, is is a really significant step forward in terms of early intervention, and absolutely um, look forward to um, supporting that implementation. And finally, just uh, I do think too, it's through the uh, inspector. It's probably the only way of making an evaluation. Uh, of uh, how effective, say, um, a policy is within a particular school uh, to ensure that they are there uh, to meet the needs of all the children prior to statement, of, uh, prior to being statement of, or whatever you know, in, in particular in relation to um, special needs. Yes, we welcome when the inspectorate can get back um, to business and and we can get that evaluation undertaken. We'll welcome that. Okay. Um, sir, can I just, you said uh, earlier in evidence that you were appointed in April 2019, so you're in post approximately about 18 months. When did you come aware of the serious situation regarding SEN in the EA? Um, so, um, Chair, I took up post, as you say, in April 2019. I, I had been the Director of Operations and Estates within the Education Authority since April 2016. And certainly in my capacity as the Director of Operations and Estates and then um, and taking up post in, um, in, in 2019, I was meeting with school leaders, with um, parents, um, with our stakeholders, um, initially in, in, in coming into post and certainly the feedback from all of those stakeholders was that they felt that this what this issue wasn't working for schools, for parents, for children um, and certainly that was what was being described to me um, by stakeholders. There was an improvement plan for this service area in place um, when I took up post and that improvement plan um, was being um, followed. However, then in September 2019, very serious accusations about the um, 
statutory operations service were made via the media about multiple delays, information governance concerns, um, about lack of rigour, um, and following that, I, that is when I commissioned the audit of practice um, within the Education Authority, and that was a team of experts in information governance and, uh, and in those areas to actually go to all five of the Education Authority offices and to assess the current practice against what, what should have been the appropriate um, service standards. So, as operations and a states director, were you responsible for SEND? No. Who was? The director of Children and Young People's Services. Who was? Dr Claire Mangan. Um, when the, the um, whistleblower went to the media, I think around, as you say, September 2019, um, serious allegations were made, and we've had uh, your ongoing report and the, the audit office report. Um, it would seem to me, having read reports and being a member of the Education Committee since uh, Storm was re-established, that this problem is deep-rooted, systemic and cultural. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. Why was that? What were the reasons for that? I think there were a range of reasons. Um, I think certainly it's systemic, and I think I think we can see that um, clearly um, as we look right across. Um, I think we were making changes in one area um, and not, as I described earlier, potentially looking at the impact they would have in another area. So I think we were very clearly operating in a silo. Um, and I think we, and I think that was even within directorates, never mind across directorates. So I think changes were being um, implemented without due regard. I don't think we were managing the processes end to end. I think we were managing um, disparate bits of them. I don't think we had a culture of um, sound information management, and we certainly didn't have a performance framework or a corporate governance framework that would allow that to come forward. Um, I, I think they're probably some of the main issues, Chair. Mr Baker, in his evidence to the committee earlier, um, giving credit to the EA, said there was better management in place in the last 12 months. Um, so who or what was responsible for this totally unacceptable situation that was affecting hundreds, if not thousands, of young people across Northern Ireland? As I've said earlier, Chair, there is an investigation underway within the Education Authority at this point in time. It is being conducted by two independent investigators, although it is being overseen by a committee of the board. Um, it has not concluded yet at this time. When, when will it conclude its work? I'm not sure, Chair. I wouldn't like to um, commit to a timescale that isn't of my um, delivery. It, it's with the um, staffing committee, um, um, but I'm happy to come back and provide an update on that at the right and appropriate time I mean, if that's I, necessary. I have to say, um, I share Mr Hillage's view earlier. Um, uh, I think uh, an independent <coughs> inquiry, given the scale, longitude, the import of these issues, an independent inquiry was something I would have preferred. And I think the earlier this report is put in the public domain, the better. And, I, and if you would come back to this committee around uh, a timescale, because there is huge issues of confidence around this issue for our constituents, and most importantly for those young and vulnerable people out there and their families. And, and I, I, I would like to see that uh, come in uh, as soon as is possible. Um, in terms of where we are and the position we've got to now. Um, in June of 2020, I understand there were 285 children with no place, 129 of those in mainstream schools, 126 in special schools. Um, by September, I think that was down to less than five, which I commend. But how do we get to the situation where 285 children across Northern Ireland uh, are in this position. And the other point is as well, in relation to the education library boards, there was a differential across the education library boards in terms of how the SEN was promoted and, and, and progressed and statementing. Um, have we, and I know you touched on earlier, are you confident that we are getting to the point where that is going to be equalised across Northern Ireland and that that is something which is not going to be allowed to continue where 
in some areas, former regions, there are children that are disadvantaged compared to others. It's just totally unacceptable. So, Chair, I will maybe ask Una to speak further on this, but just to say we are assured around the, the processes that they are regionally consistent. What is not regionally consistent, because it is, as you described, historical and, and we need to address, is the level of provision across regions. And we know that that is variable um, and remains variable. Um, the Permanent Secretary, when he was in earlier, did describe the pilot that is taking place, for example, around being able to put in place um, learning support units now without the need for a development proposal. And that is something that we really welcome, um, because it means where we identify need or identify a gap, we will be able to move more quickly um, to be able to um, fill that need or fill that gap without having necessarily to do that through a very cumbersome um, bureaucratic process. But in relation to specifically around the summer months and, and, and how we're moving that forward, I'll ask Una to. Yeah, it's obviously been it was a very difficult time for parents, first and foremost, uh, Chair. Mm -hmm. um, to be in that situation at the end of June and not know what class or what school your child was going to be going to, with, particularly when they have special educational needs. So, um, what we did was we set up 29 additional classes in 27 schools, and we did that based on where the children were actually located and where the, where the school's capacity in terms of space. Now, we still have an issue in that we have particular regions, particular areas um, that don't have enough special school places, either in the mainstream um, classes or in special schools, and that is going to be a continuing challenge for us. But what we are doing is we are actually taking this back. So instead of waiting until June, as was the case this year, we, by October, by the end of October, we will know who the children are that actually are, need to be placed, and we will be working towards making sure that they have places much sooner. Um, I do need again, um, just in terms of our limitations, children are constantly coming through the statementing processes. So um, there are children will come through in March, April, May who will still need to be placed. But what we are t trying to do is to make sure that we know much earlier um, for the for the key, you know, the bulk of, of, of the children coming through, and to make sure that we can try and identify suitable provisions, working with schools, obviously, um, to make sure that they are provided for in suitable places. Can I ask? Uh, I'll bring other members in a moment. But how, can I ask how long has this been going on? Do you want me to take that? Sir? Just in terms of places. <coughs> in terms of the what we're to, what we're talking about today. In terms of the the what I said earlier was a culture, uh, a deep rooted systemic culture, which you've as chief executive has accepted was there. How long has that been going on within the education authority? Is it going back to the Education Library Board days and even beyond uh, the, the establishment of the Education Authority? Probably hard to comment on that, Chair, um, given, given the newness of, of, of yeah. you know, to the Education Authority. And yeah. I've been there since 2016, so I couldn't comment on what went before in the Education and Library Boards. Um, what I would say is some of, of, of the planning that we're now identifying that we need to do earlier and the area planning that we need to do um, we know has been um, a requirement for some time and we do need to bring that forward. I mean, it, it seems to me uh, as in a constituency MLA and we've all had um, these cases in our constituency offices as a governor of two schools um, and it seems to me this is a scandal and it's been going on far too long. There's a failure to appreciate uh, our young people and the, the challenges that they and their families uh, had to endure. I personally dealt with a case of a, of a, of a child over a year uh, uh, trying to get that child statement and the huge anxiety that that caused that, that, that child's parents, the, the, the child itself, um, the principal of the school, the other teachers in the school, classroom assistants, and the other children in the classroom. And I, I, I think uh, this is a scandal, and that's why I think, and I, I, I'm saying this personally, this is not the view of the committee, this is my personal opinion, that uh, I think because of the issue that this is a scandal and has gone on for so long, so long that you cannot tell us how long today, that a, an independent inquiry 
should have been instituted to give confidence around this issue to the people of Northern Ireland around this hugely sensitive and important issue. Uh, I have some other questions I will come back to, but I will move on to other members at this stage. Uh, Mr Boylan. Hey, thank you, Chair, and you are very welcome. I am. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, it is a down report, there is no doubt about it. Hey, and, you know, I am just listening to some of, the, some of the answers and listening to some of the questions. I mean, um, I am just trying to you know, compose a few questions. There is not many, to be honest with you, and I am trying to try and, uh, get the best out of this session, to be honest with you. Say in terms of just um, see if the reports hadn't been carried out, because I'm mindful there was a 13-year review. You know what we heard from the first session, and I mean, how long would this have continued if we hadn't had the reports? I mean, learning from what was sitting in your desk when you moved in, and I, I'm on the board of governors, so I understand from the old system, the new one, in terms of the, the ELBs and the EA. So how long? That's my first question. How long would this have continued? All of these reports being conducted in 2017, plus some of the work that you may have been conducted by others previously as well. well the the um, audit of practice that we conducted ourselves <coughs> during November December 2019 um, provided a clear set of recommendations in this area that we immediately um, took measures to address. Um, at that point in time, uh, rather than waiting for the conclusion of the other reports. But this uh, report has certainly um, strengthened those findings and recommendations and added to them. Um, but so but it's some reflection of a 2017 further. and a 2020 follow up report from the audit. I mean, that, that's very concerning because I want to just pick up on some of the points, some of the members, because see, in terms of, was Una was saying <coughs> part of the process is down to school and school resources? You know how you online, how you pick, and how you support the you know children's schools, and then that's one question. So that's right, I'm on the board, so we understand that at the end of end the resources. But on the other hand, you said even to my colleague, even if you had the resources, it may not be a result either. So well, it's not all about resources, and that's 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 very concerning because I know how hard schools were on boards, and we know how we, you know because because principals now are managers and. Accountants and all of that have to do all these things, trying to stretch budgets. So, so my question really is: that in one one respect, we're trying to use whatever resource we got, but there's a whole team of players and a whole partnership in there. So, in your view, I mean, where are the players, or who are all the players? Because I see this outside of all of that. I think there's a broader, broader picture, because in identifying all of this, and I'd like your views on that and what's going in, what you are trying to, you know. Impose now that that'll that'll come to fruition in relation to all that. I think my my comment earlier <coughs> about um, was was not wanting to build a, if you like a, a, a large corporate centre that is around resourcing schools. Um, resource schools need to be resourced to do what they need to do at the first three stages of the code of practice, and and, and I would be clear about that. Um, and then we need to have the right and appropriate um, support services in there to be enable them to do that. And do you want to say more about this? Yeah, no, I, I, I think absolutely we need to support the schools with at, at the early stage and make sure that we have programmes in place and resources in place through our classroom assistants who are properly trained, who are supported to actually deliver so they can um, support schools to achieve educational um, outcomes for children. But what I would also say is that the voluntary and community sector play a, you know, a key role in this. Schools should be part of communities. And I suppose what, one of the things that we see when we're, when we're trying to place children is that we're having to place them outside of their communities. So it's really important, I think, that we see the whole, this, take a whole school approach to this and make sure that we are working in partnership with, with our colleagues in health, with the community and voluntary sector, with the other, organi you know, the other organisations um, to maximise um, our input and to work in partnership, really to collaborate, to make that difference. And, and we have a long way to go, to be we honest. Have. Um, yeah. Just because I want to reflect on some figures, and it's not all about figures. And I know they asked about analytics because this is about individual school mm -hmm. children. Uh, it says here eighty-six percent of children with special education needs leave in school with at least five GCSEs, and that's commendable in 2014-15. But that wouldn't be a true reflection right across the board. It is the data we have at the minute. So, and I've, I've said the, the 
Derek Baker previous, we have failed some children. And as part of your review, and I know that Chair's asked for independent review, is that going to be factored in in terms of those children Daphne have, to, have been failed over the last number of years? And have you thought of that? Are you reflecting on that? Or is there going to be any commentary around that element of it? Children have been failed, and, and, and we have accepted that. Um, and I apologised for that at, at our education um, committee. Um, and they've been failed in a number of ways. It, it, it's hard to actually understand the impact of that, I think, at a population level. But, but we know and um, individual children have either um, not been placed in the right setting, have struggled to be placed in the right setting, um, and we know that that has a detriment to them or they haven't had the right level of assistance that they should have had. So uh, we, we have. We have failed children. and. and, and um, we need to move forward to make sure that we are not in that position um, anymore. I um, feel very strongly about that as well. Um, the impact on individual children and individual families, I think, are the things that you know, are, are, are all the communications and correspondence that, that you all receive. And they are very real and very real experiences um, for children. And as I say, I, I, have, I have met parents and they have described some of it to me. Um, and it's, it's not an acceptable standard, and I'm, I'm, I'm clear about that. And just uh, two more points, Chair, and let Pellas in. In terms of, we talked about understanding the demand and, and identifying the overall need, because, I mean, like I said, it, it, it sits outside, the department sits outside yourselves. But we need a better way, besides putting all the processes and all the stages in place and all the resources, we need a better way of identifying and supporting children. Early intervention is key. Because we hear all the time the sponge years are a certain age, and then we're hearing children getting statemented at 11 and 12 years of age in post primary schools, and some of them may do well and some not. So, if we're serious about addressing it, and obviously the report has highlighted some of the process, um, would you just like to comment on how, how we go about, you know, understanding the demand and, and then defend the need? And so I think one of the key pieces of feedback that we get is that with the time allocation model, the unmet needs held at school level. So I think that's something in terms of the review of the model that we need to better understand, which is how do, how do we get a, an overall picture of that? So if schools are deciding which children to put forward, and actually there are a range of, of children in the school who could benefit from early intervention, I think it's important that we get the overall picture on that and not just those children who the school... Um, have, to, have to be put in a position to put forward. And just finally, in terms of expertise, have we got the expertise? Have we did we lose expertise in the changeover between the ALB? Bearing in mind some of the comments that you are already made about practices in the past, but in terms of expertise now, where we sit? Yeah, there's no doubt we lost expertise, but we've also gained expertise now. So, for, for example, the um, person who's leading on this um, for us within the Education Authority is a seconded school principal. He has, he has many experiences in this field. Um, so I, I believe that that in itself will, will be very helpful for us in terms of understanding the different perspectives. And, and just finally, Chair, I just remembered Mr Muir mentioned a good point. He says that you're part of the jigsaw. I think you're a part of the cold face of it, to be honest with you, where this is rolled out. The year is definitely part of the cold face and needs to make sure that this year is rolled out on the ground where it's at of the cold face. Okay, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Um, like, like other members, um, I'm aware of huge frustration from schools, principals, teachers on the bottleneck that exists as a result of uh, rationing of education psychology assessments. And you've indicated that. Uh, uh, you're aware of the importance of early intervention, but that rationing, would you not accept, it is resulting in no intervention, not even support for the teachers uh, with the child that they have that they're needing help with in, in the classroom, and then the adverse effect on other members of, the, of, that, of that class? I, I, I think, as well as the volume of services that we have available at stage three, I think it's important that schools and children can access the services we have available at stage three as well. And I think that's part of what the bottleneck, bottleneck is now as well. And I believe there are services available at stage three 
that should not require an educational psychology assessment that currently do, um, so as well as the allocation model for educational psychologists, I think there is something about direct access to stage three services as well in order to enhance and improve the early intervention and, and really do that as quickly as we possibly can. And in order to be aware of, of the scale of the problem, you need to know how many pupils that teachers would want to refer. Now, that information is not stored centrally, but it's available in each school in, the, in their uh, 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 special educational needs register. Why is it not held centrally so that we know the real scale of the wishes of teachers to refer pupils to uh, an educational psychologist. That, that was my, my commentary earlier about really fully understanding our demand because all that unmet need is held at school level and, and I'm not sure how we could ever be sure we have the appropriate resource to meet it if we don't know what it is. So that's a significant piece of work, there's no doubt about that, about how we might actually capture that and how we might capture that in a meaningful way. But it's no doubt the single biggest piece of feedback that school leaders have given me in that space that we need to find a way to be able to do that. And we need to find a way to be able to do that that doesn't then actually add an additional burden onto the school as well. Okay. For the paragraph uh, 219, and in it, it indicates that uh, each of the services have a different way of quantifying service capacity and average response time. Why is there not a consistent method of recording uh, the levels of, of demand throughout all schools? There needs to be. Um, is, so, sorry, is the it's five years since this, the boards have been amalgamated. Why, why is there not there? Why is it not there now? You've been opposed for eighteen months. Why is it not there now? I think it, it refers back to some of my, my previous comments to, to the previous questions, which is. Um, it's not that we still have a variation particularly around local offices, it's about services and different services grew those ways of monitoring um, their weights themselves through potentially individual spreadsheets for example, so we didn't have a corporate approach to um, our data and a corporate approach to our information and that's something that we are currently um, doing as I described earlier. Is this not fundamental, a very basic requirement in any system, that, that you have one system operating in, in each school? I believe that it is a fundamental requirement, yes. I believe it, it's very important for us, and I believe that we won't be in a position to make truly informed decisions until we have it. And when will it be there? I don't know that yet. But that piece of work is being worked through as part of the overall review. OK. Um, the issue of classroom assistance. Um, I'm aware of very direct one-to-one -one work with classrooms assistance at primary school, not as well informed at, at uh, post-primary schools of their role, but I have faced criticism from uh, some classroom assistants that their job is to stand at the back of the classroom and not to intervene, and that multiple classroom assistants that we're paying for using the same money are standing at the back of the classroom and not intervening. Is that good use of public money? Is it good for the children? No, it's not. It's not. It's not good use of public money. And I think that's something, again, school leaders have certainly, particularly in post-primary schools, have certainly articulated that they are not sure if the classroom assistant model is the most right and appropriate model to be used at certain phases in post-primary school. We have agreed to move forward with a pilot, and I don't know, Una, if you want to say more about that. Yeah, I think your, your, your point is really well made. We need to make sure we're spending a significant sum on classroom assistance, and they're absolutely valuable, but we need to make sure that we are using them in a way that's actually um, going to support children to, to achieve educational outcomes, and that requires us to, for them to become part of the, of, of the team approach. Um, we are working through with a number of, of principals on pilots on, on it to develop a pilot that will actually allow us to test what the most effective model is. Now we know that uh, um, there is huge pressure on us to actually allocate classroom assistance um, to, to children, and sometimes maybe when it's when it's maybe not deemed to be maybe the best way forward, but that security that, that classroom assistance provides, um, uh, you know, is 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 a real pressure. Um, and uh, so we, what we need to do is build confidence up in our parents, in our schools, so that, that we can find ways that actually allow, particularly where children are, are getting a bit older and we need to be encouraging them to become more independent, that actually they become less reliant on a classroom assistant. And allocating uh, hours for the classroom assistant in a particular class to follow a particular child in need, yeah. is there any appreciation or understanding of the number of classroom assistants already in the class that this pupil is in? 
that is taken into consideration um, whenever the whenever the statement is being is being made. Um, so that, that will change. The, that that are, will change through different yeah. classes yes, and different subjects. Yes, and certainly what some of the principals are saying to us, um, Chair, is that they would like classroom assistance for particular subject areas in the post primary. So they would like a classroom assistant who maybe we develop and train up in relation to supporting literacy or supporting numeracy or supporting ICT. So they become a part of the school team rather than an allocation. You know, a classroom so many hours for a child that follows around all of the different classes. So that's the pilot, that's what, we're to, that's what we're working towards to see can we test other ways of working that parents will feel confident with and schools will feel confident with and particularly the children will actually and young people will welcome. I think in one of your graphs there's been an increase in funding in that area, uh, uh, so, so I'm welcome that. Um, final question then. Um, on page, I think it's page two of the report, it's in fig, fig two anyway, there, there's a graph showing the very significant upward lift in the cost and currently at £311 million. Pounds. Now, you will have an understanding when each of those children that are attracting the cost will leave and the likely number of coming into the system. So can you provide us with projected costs in the current model going forward? Because that's very important. We need to know what is the cost going forward and is this the best use of our public funding or what should we be doing to best help uh, pupils in, in need? Do, is there a projection, is there a projection figures available? We don't have a projection we, figure, no. But who, who plans? We know, we know, I suppose, Chair, if you don't mind me saying, we, we know that there are, uh, there's a year-on-year -year increase in the number of, of um, children coming through with special educational needs. And if we look, for example, in 2000, and you know, by comparison to 2015-16, we've a 15.8 per cent increase in the number of children um, with statements. And we know the costs of each of, of, of those statements in terms of the number of hours. So we, you know, we, we have some sense of, of what, you know, that there's a growing cost. Some of our growing costs is also related to um, things like the, the um, increase in inflation, um, the teacher salary review. Um, we have there, there's you know those factors need to be taken into consideration. Um, but part of this is turning this round so that we're not we're, we are less dependent on 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 statements if that is if that is feasible. So we try to manage to manage this and create through early intervention and other models, actually try to reduce the demand. Um, it's actually really spent to save, in, in a sense, if we can get the right early intervention models in um, that work and, and try and manage the demand um, and the number of, of children with statements. I, I fully support the concept of early, earlier intervention. That, 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 that's good. But I, I am surprised that you do not have some sort of projection or expected costs going forward. Do you not know how many uh, children with special education needs who are leaving this, uh, yes. uh, next year, at the end, end of June, and how many you expect to come in. Can you not give some sort of figure of the projected, projected need on the current system next year? Who, who yes. knows that? Yes, we do. We actually do collect the number on, on our. Um, we collect the number of children um, each month who are who are leaving. It's normally done at a, at a point in time in the year, so we know that those children that come up beyond compulsory ages. Are, are leaving, and that is taken into consideration. But year on year, the the number of children with statements who require support is is increasing. But that is taken into consideration. So, so I'm, I'm quite surprised you don't have a rough idea of figures, because you will know the cost of those leaving, and you will know roughly the cost if the similar number come back into the system, and that will be a higher number. So, so do you not have some projection going forward? Do you not provide us with figures? I wouldn't want to give a rough figure. But it's certainly something I can come back to you with. Because yeah, I think it's important that everybody understands it, so we come up with a better system. Yeah. Mr. Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mr. Are you also aware that a child that is on a waiting list for a special needs assessment, that if they move school, that they then move to the bottom of the list? Would you say that this needs or can be addressed, with probably zero cost? Yes, it does need to be addressed. Um, if, yes, I wasn't aware that that was a practice. So, if it is a practice, then it does need to be addressed. Yes. Got a few complaints, so just okay. something you could look at. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Thank you.
Um, can I just ask, um, returning to the, like some members have indicated, I think of further questions they want to ask. But in terms of the um, the board that's overseeing this re this report, this internal report, who's chairing that? The chair of the Children and Young People Services Committee. Uh, who is? Pat Carville. And is he? She. Sorry. She is the. Uh, is that a member of the Education Authority's board? Or? Yes. Right. And how is that? How is that group populated? Who are the other members? Um, the Reverend Robert Hearn. Just one other person. No. Um, and the Reverend Amanda. Certainly, my. I have just taken a complete blank on the chair. I am so sorry. Right. So, is that are they are all are they all members of the EA's board? They are. Yes. So, three board members. That's the subcommittee. Yeah. Right. So, three. And who took the decision that on this internal report? Your board. It's an internal investigation. Yeah. Who took the decision that that's how you would go forward? The board took that decision. Right. So, the board took a decision that there would be an internal investigation. Three of its members were put, put on I, a... I took the decision that there would be an internal investigation, and then, as matters progressed, Chair, a subcommittee of the board was established right. to oversee that. So was your board in agreement with your decision? Yes. Right. So you took a decision, your board agreed. Three members of your board were asked to sit on this group with two um, independent investigators? There's two independent investigators, and there's an independent HR advisor. Right. So those six people are bringing this forward. Um, why, given the issues that members have teased out today and that we've read in this report and that have been played out in the public domain, why was there no understanding or appreciation within the Education Authority that really around these issues that are of such importance that an independent inquiry was uh, not the way forward? Well, I think, Chair, what I am describing is an independent investigation. I do not think that precludes any independent inquiry from, from happening, and I think I am on the record as saying before that if we conclude that actually in order to do this we need some independent oversight, I, I am more than happy yep. that we will do that, so, but we, we need to do that at the right okay. and appropriate did, time, Chair. Did your board or you, um, as long as the Chief Executive, not give a time period for this piece of work to be concluded and get and reported back to the board. No. Why? Because it's linked to internal processes, Chair, and I, I don't think it's. See, my concern is that when we look at the figures for this year, I am told there are 107 children that are waiting more than 80 weeks. No, that was this time last year, Chair. Yeah, right. What's the current position in terms of the number of children that are waiting 80 weeks now? None. None. How many are waiting more than 60 weeks? Ten. Ten. But that's into a second year. There are ten children. Yeah. Um, and you've given a commitment that no child should wait longer than 26 weeks. Is that right? Taking into consideration, Chair, valid exceptions. So... 26 weeks is half a year. Yes, yes. the 26 weeks is based on the statutory um, time frame that is set out for us in legislation. So that, is, that allows us to take through the process of, of, of the providing the, stat the statutory assessment. So that's within, the ta that's within the time frame. That will reduce under the new SEND legislation um, that to 22 weeks whenever that's implemented. Okay. How can the EEA determine if education and educational psychology resources are appropriate when there is no overall measure of unmet need? Mm. I think, Chair, that was my earlier point. I, I don't know that we would ever be able to determine what resource is fully required until we have an understanding of that unmet need, and that is currently held at school level. So that is something it, it's, it's, we can review the time allocation model, but until we actually have a full picture of what the current need is, we won't, we won't be in a position to be able to deliver the appropriate resource, and so that will have to form a key part of that. Well, given, given the importance of early intervention in terms of the child's health, mental well-being, education, and, and the, the child's family, in terms of that early intervention being more effective and more cost-effective um, to the taxpayer, um, 
Why is there no target for how quickly a child will access stage three support services? Well, there, there isn't one currently, but as I described earlier, Chair, we are moving forward with our uh, performance management framework and certainly access to services will form a key part around the standards that we set as part of that performance management framework. See, I, have, I have to say I am concerned that we should not look at this as what is happening from September of last year when the whistleblower came out. I am concerned that this has been going on for some time and therefore um, you know, the, the, the reality is that is why I believe there is a huge huge issue of confidence in the Education Authority in Northern Ireland, particularly around this issue. Although I do share the point that Mr Muir made earlier on about the organisation and its functionality. And um, I just think that um, there, there are other issues there that, that, that really, frankly, are of huge importance uh, to our young people that um, we, will, we will come back to uh, in terms of Questioning, but I know that Mr. Hildage wants to come in. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for letting us back in again. Uh, while, while we're here in the spotlight is on on SEN, are, are there any connections and dependencies elsewhere in EA which impact on SEN, which require attention as well to help SEN out? I, I, for example, transport area planning, capital projects, health, well-being, finance. Is there any of those immediately impinging? Well, they, they certainly all impact on they SEN. All impact. They all impact, and um, SEN impacts on all of their ability, if you like, to deliver their services as well. So, um, area planning is a key one. We've 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 described earlier in terms of the the mismatch in provision across particular parts of Northern Ireland, and I think the only way we will really be able to address that is through a rigorous area planning um, process. Um, our transport related SEN costs are considerable. Um, we know that children with SEN rely heavily on transport in terms of, of, of um, being able to access their education, and so that is vitally important as well. Um, and again, in terms of the, completing the statement, the more speedily we complete the statement, then the better we have the, to put the provision in place, because the process and the statement and process is only one piece. And so, we don't want then further knock-on delays, for example, in transport or in the provision of adults assi adult assistance through EHR, for example. And that's so why it is crucial that the silos yeah. are broken down yeah. and this is tackled head on. Chair, if I come in here, no, I, I, I just want to put it on record because I know we had a ser you know we had really significant challenge in terms of the 285 children who needed to be placed by the end of June. Um, I think that actually happened because we actually worked together. We, we, the silos were broken down, and I was given the support from our um, operations and estates colleagues, from those who are working in minor works, our human resource colleagues, um, you know, the education um, school development service. Um, actually, it was a joined-up effort, and it was a corporate effort. And I actually feel very strongly that that actually was um, what actually got us over the line, and will continue to get us over the line as we um, strive towards the, the March target. And Chair, just on, re on recruitment, I understand it has been suspended since, since March. And, uh, it even in Carrick Fergus, the passing of the late Johnny McAllister, he was the lollipop man in the model school. Uh, there are kids having to cross that road in the morning with various, various educational needs. and uh, They have to face four lanes of traffic at the busy rush hour on one of the busiest roads in Northern Ireland. And the requirement there that, that has been sitting vacant for three or four months now. But yet you're still sitting in that guy's budget so in relation to that, and you have not recruited. But surely now is the time to recruit, particularly in the sand category. You know, people are sitting at home now in front of their computers and whatnot and stuff. But plenty, I want to say plenty of time, but certainly time to have a wee look at what you're offering and maybe get a form filled in on a CV off. So would it not be better now to have some form of recruitment to get your job easier? So the recruitment that has been suspended was for any new or additional posts into the organisation. It was not for replacement posts, for example, lollipop men, bus drivers, and the other area that was prioritised was the SEN area. So that that hasn't happened. So that's that you're, must, you're putting kids at risk and various educational so needs will, crossing the four lane. I, 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 for bringing in 
I will. Agency matters, Chair. Sure, you I give will, me that latitude. Just, just I will uh, <laughs> follow that up then when I when I go back because please, that's uh, not as please, a result please. of a suspension of recruitment. <laughs> that will be something else. Mm -hmm. The. Uh, all I could say, and from my point of view, in closing, sir, as, as, as chief executive of the organisation, you've told us a lot today about you would like to get rid of this, or you'd like to do that, or you'd want more of that. But you are the chief executive, and I just ask you to take on board the difficulties today and get on with it as a team. Thank you. Can I just ask, are there quotas for referrals for children um, to meet educational psychologists? Are there quotas? That's the time allocation model. Mm -hmm. And that's at stage three, mm -hmm. three services. That's the time yeah. allocation model as we described. Yeah, I mean, um, so what percentage of open assessments are now over twenty six weeks? Um, Thirty eight percent, average. Compared to what? A year ago. Mm -hmm. Would have been well into mid forties. So ten percent better. Need to, I'd need to double check that yeah. figure now. Um, but but it is it is you know it's down we have it is brought down and I suppose that's that's um, impacted because when we bring the longest mm -hmm. the longest weights down then that's going to have um, the most impact in terms of your of your average. Okay, um, as I was saying, saying to Mr. Baker earlier, I was part of the education um, committee group that met with the special educational needs principals informally, and then they came to the to the committee. Can I ask, and uh, you know, obviously they face particular and very difficult challenges um, with their teams. What is the position in terms of area planning for special educational needs across Northern Ireland? So we've just launched our consultation document on um, uh, the framework for area planning for special schools and the framework for area planning for um, specialist provision in mainstream schools, which we hope will set out a future direction of travel now for area planning for special schools and move it forward. So, so uh, are special education uh, needs principals regularly consulted uh, on an ongoing basis around these issues? So that was the very purpose of this consultation framework, M Chair, and it was developed alongside special school principals. So that for the first time in special school area planning, we could have, a, if you like, an open, transparent framework against which the decisions would be assessed, and that's what we're out to consult with at the moment. So, do we know what the projection is, and look, does it what it looks like for the next three to five years? That's the work that Inna has described that we're currently undertaking. Mm. And when will that be concluded, Anna? I think this will need to obviously go into the, the programme approach that we're taking, um, taking forward. We do know that, and I have spoken to um, special school principals as part of the work in, in terms of trying to get the number of children placed, um, and I, you know, they are clearly telling us that their schools are at capacity, um, they are full, um, and, and they have gone beyond, I suppose, where they are using spaces that were never mm -hmm. intended to be classrooms. Yeah. Um, we know that there are... Um, are over 6,000 pupils enrolled in special educational, um, special ed schools, and that's increasing. Um, the complexity of the children are also increasing in terms of medical needs, and that in, in, in turn then creates um, a significant challenge in terms of space. Um, and that as well. So we do know that we have to work with our special schools and with principals to make sure that we understand what the demand is and to work with area planning both at the department and within our own educational um, authority to make sure that we understand where the demand is and how we then um, use the information that's coming from the statutory operations process to inform the development um, within the, the school bills. Um, so it's really important, and I think it goes back to the points well made in terms of working in silo. We need to make sure that 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 we are sharing this intelligence to make sure that we're making informed decisions in relation so, to so where the schools should. So be. five years ago, and how how long does the does the education authority look forward in terms of future proofing and projections? Five years ago, ten years ago, was this work being done? I can't comment on that because I'm fairly relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, to to th to this, but um, Sarah, can you comment? I, I don't think I can comment on on ten years ago. I think what I can say, um, Chair, is that 
I think we did it on an ad hoc basis and that we did it on a more year to year than long term planning and that's exactly the shift that we want to make now that Una has described so that we can we know from birth when some of these children will enter our system and so therefore that's the point at which we should be starting to map and project right. that and no we haven't been. I say, have to say I am alarmed to hear that it was done on an ad hoc basis and there, and there, there, had, there clearly wasn't the sufficiency and joined upness across government around these issues. I sincerely hope that that joined upness is there now because I, I, I feel I have to reach the conclusion from the, from the sessions today that there has not been sufficiency in terms of the recognition of the importance and the, and the special children that we're talking about here. Um, and the, the value of early interventions. We don't know, uh, in terms of this deep-rooted systemic and cultural problem that there was within your organisation, which you've accepted, I'm concerned we don't know how long this has been going on. There's no answer. We don't know how many. That figure isn't known. And I think that's a sad reflection of the education authority in Northern Ireland over the last period of time. There is a huge duty of responsibility on your shoulders as a Chief Executive and on your board um, to, to ensure that this is addressed as a matter of urgency and these completely unacceptable figures are uh, addressed for the, for the good and welfare of all these young people, their families and, and the teachers who work with them and the staff who support the teachers. Uh, and I would implore you uh, to come back to us as soon as you can with an end date on those issues in terms of the, this, this internal investigation. And we will have some conversations after you leave here around that issue. I'll be open and honest with you, um, because I don't think a number of questions that I've asked have been answered sufficiently, and I think other members are the same. This is a hugely important <coughs> issue, and one that we need to put right once and for all. If no one, other member has indicated they want to speak, I want to thank you very much. And at this point, I would ask Mr. Donnelly or Mr. Stevenson, if they wish to ask or add anything. Um, no, just one point uh, about uh, case reviews that are, is very relevant to forecasting that uh, you know interventions will not be for the full life of a, a school child. That maybe if an intervention works after a couple of years, then cases should be reviewed. And just whether the witnesses have any comment on the importance of case review. Yes. Um through the chair, yes, I, I would agree, um, and I think that that is, um, uh, if you like, part of the um, issue in terms of the model as well. So that if you receive provision um, early in your school life, that that provision will remain with you um, right throughout your school life. And I think, um, in terms of promoting independence as well, as Una has described, that's something we need to become more rigorous about. Yes. Chair, if I could just come in there. The annual review is carried out as part of the statutory process. So each child who has a statement um, is, has an annual review. Um, it's carried out by the school. It's led by the school. And where uh, the school principal or, or Senko or teachers feel that there needs to be an amendment to the provision that's actually made, then the Education Authority's statutory operations um, officer will attend that. That review, um, there is some very good practice has happened. Um, for example, in the in the area of diabetes, for example, where children start, you know, they come and they have they have statements, and they're through the annual through or they no longer require a statement for that for that um, purpose. So those are the sorts of things that we do need to look at and can look at as part of the overall programme approach. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very good afternoon. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Mr. Stevenson, do you want to come in? Uh, no question for me, Chair. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, before we go into closed session to deal with some issues, um, I, I, I am open here, but uh, I, I think there are a number of questions there that um, weren't answered, as I've said uh, in, in summing up the meeting. Uh, in terms of, uh, I, I am concerned that this internal investigation seems to be open-ended, uh, and this is a hugely important issue. And therefore, I think, uh, and in terms of the fact that 
on the, on the back of this damning report that we have, have been presented to us from the, the Audit Office, and I thank the Audit Office and commend them for it. Um, uh, given the import of this issue and the fact that so many, there are so many questions out there that are not being answered, um, uh, and there are many families out there who, who want those questions to be answered, um, I, I personally think, and I'm not making a proposal because I, I chair the meeting and I don't think it's appropriate that I do, um, I, I think we should be asking for an independent inquiry around this issue. We could have authority, Chair. Hmm? We could have authority. Or? I don't know, uh, uh, and that's something which I, we can get it clarified. Yeah. Certainly, Chair. It was it was hard enough there. Now it was basically there was agreement with most points that members made. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. That's right. Or, there was really nothing substantial in the answers, to be honest. Yeah. It was all around in this investigation mostly and. Hey, Mr. Beggs, did you want to come in? Um, I, I don't know if that's ever happened before, and there's the issue is are we straying under the, the specific role of the Education Committee? Mm. Um, uh, our role normally is to investigate reports and make, make a, a report on it and feedback and, and, and ask questions and draw something else out. Um, I think we're in dangerous strand. Um, well, that's that's so. yeah, and that's why we get very um, clarity uh, uh, and clarification around it. Um, my my point is simply that we would be asking for, uh, I mean, um, making a recommendation that it should be an in, in, in independent inquiry. Mr. Muir, did you want to come in? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I think obviously we get advice on the issue, and it's maybe something to consider as part of the report and the recommendations yeah. around yeah. that. I think one of the issues is obviously this is long; it's been in post for. 18 months or thereabouts, but these are clearly, as you uh, outlined or, or ascertained, these are systemic, systemic issues. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether it would be appropriate for us to be looking for evidence from the chair of the Education Authority, whose tenure obviously extends way beyond what that is of the chief executive. And obviously, there was a previous chief executive in place um, prior to Mrs. Long, and I would really find out how you know we managed to get into this situation. Sure. Yeah, well, I don't see any reason why we, we, we couldn't. No, because I think it's important. You, to you want to make clarity. that a proposal? Yes. Okay. So, Mr. Muir is making a proposal that we invite the chair of the Education Authority board yes. and to come in front of the committee. Is someone to second that? Second Mr. Hildich. And we'll get clarification on the other in, in terms of the. Um, I just think the, the seriousness of the situation to not have an answer when a, a report is going to, an internal investigation is going to conclude. Is not acceptable. And also, I don't think there's clarity whether the outcome of that investigation would be public either. That's right. And to beat the 13 years in the oil. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The other thing is then, members, um, I, I don't think anyone or has anyone any questions for Mr. Mr. Uh, Irwin or Mr. Baker. We can let them set them free. <laughs> Agreed. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, members. Um, are we content to move into closed session? Great. Content. Great. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber.